Cool. Thanks, everyone, for being so patient. Um, I'm going to call this meeting to order. This is a special meeting of the Isla Vista Community Services District. Um, calling it to order at 1.22 p.m. I'd like to announce that this meeting is being recorded. Jonathan, will you call the roll? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Caught you off guard. Yes, Director Brandt. Here. Director Bertrand. Here. Director Nguyen. Here. Director Geis. Here. Director Freeman. Here. And Director Hedges and Thurlow will be absent. Okay. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge the Chumash people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Chumash elders past, present, and future. We call this place, Enescoyo, the land that Isla Vista sits upon, their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Chumash community for their stewardship and support, and we look forward to un strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. Okay, this is the board retreat, so um, the purpose of this meeting isn't necessarily to take action like we do at regular board meetings, but really just to provide our board and our staff an opportunity to um, do some visioning and sort of talk about things from a 30,000 feet level. So thank you so much to the members of the public who are here uh, for participating. We're glad to have you. Um, at this time, we're going to do the public comment period. If there is any uh, matter that a member of the public wishes to speak on that is not on the agenda, um, now is the time when you can speak. Is there any public comment? Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. I would like to address the issue of public notice about special meetings, especially when they're in a different time and place and day. And I would ask that we, I know that legally you've done your job, but I feel that there's a bigger job, and that is to make um, meetings socially friendly and available to, especially when they're here, because this is a different part of the community, different experiences. And so consider that as well as what's legally required. Is it really fair to tell people that tomorrow we're having a meeting? possibly very important, not because you're going to take action, but because of what you're addressing. So just consider that. Thank you. OK, are there any other members of the public who wish to speak? All right. I do. Yeah, oh. yes. yeah, I, I concur with uh, Maya's remarks. Uh, I feel like uh, the, the noticing is really inadequate, especially yeah. The only tangible notice I've seen posted was on the window, and I only heard, just heard about it uh, on the window of the office. Uh, and it, it, it creates an impression of lack of transparency and shadiness, and um, erodes the tr tr community trust. So I would really encourage the board to, um, or staff to, um, post physical notices as well as using your social media resources. Thank you. Um, okay. Jonathan, just for, so for the record, um, <coughs> agenda was posted every Friday at 5 p.m., okay. which, you know, I wanted to do it early, but my things in my personal schedule, my housing situation got in the way. Okay. So I wanted to do it Friday morning. And so if members of the public want to uh, join our email list also so they'll get uh, regular notifications when our email comes out, they can talk to you? They can talk to me and there's a form on our website to fill out. Okay, very cool. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Just a minute. From the data. I, I am on the email and I just got it yesterday. Um, it's on the website. Thank you. Okay. So with that, um, we are going to move to uh, section three, discussion and action items. Um, so I think we're going to take things a little out of order since Ross isn't here to provide us with the uh, presentation with 3.1. Uh, but just before we begin, uh, I think everyone's had a chance to meet him, but I wanted to introduce William, who is uh, the assistant uh, for Ross uh, at Alex Shire and Winder, um, our legal counsel. Um, thanks so much for being here. It's really awesome to have you on board. It's super awesome to finally meet you and uh, it's really cool that you've got that personal connection to IV just like Ross does. So yeah, it's great to be here. Awesome. Okay, so we wanted to begin with um, 3.2. The space. Oh, oh the space, the I'm space sorry. Issue, yes. yes. So we can, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this. Basically, once Ross gets here, we can move into that more substantial presentation. But I wanted to just share with the board 
uh, since our last discussion in April, what I've been thinking and what people I've talked about talked to about this have thought, and then get some more direction before we bring something back, probably in August. I really want to wait till Diana and Deborah too are, you know, full time working to kind of talk to them more about what kind of space they need to work and you know what kind of you know what what the staff we actually currently have uh, need right now. So. We'll take the input today, and then I'll also work with them, and we'll we'll bring something back, probably a couple iterations to review. But basically, I know at the last meeting we had <coughs> talked about the district office moving to the upstairs part of the building. Uh, my feeling right now is that I think the current location is the best location, just because we've already established our, you know, our existence there. Our kind of we have the ground level view of what's going on, so I think. I'm thinking that the ground level office would be good to keep as our district office as a more co-working space. It's more than you know, it's not a space for private meetings, it's just for people to do work. And then the smaller upstairs we have a very large room that's bigger than the current district office, and then a smaller room that's about the size of the survivor resource room. Um, I'm, I propose maybe making that one like a private meeting room so that if you have to have a private meeting with someone whether it's me or a director or Diana or anybody, uh, they could use that as where you know, you'd go to meet with someone or a group uh, in a more conference style meeting. We'll probably try to set up like a TV <coughs> up there, get it set up to do really good uh, meetings like that. And then the bigger space, I think, cannot, can be, we, I think it could be something we can explore what to do with because uh, me and Deborah and Diana will definitely be able to work uh, in the downstairs portion and we have an idea of putting like a reception desk area in the community center itself where people can you know there's just basic materials and workspace if she wants to be stationed there during an event and so with that I think we might be able to just have that bigger space upstairs you know we, we can explore what to do with it that's kind of you know it's a fun thing to be able to determine what to do there uh, I think the home for good could stay where it is. I asked them if they wanted to move upstairs or stay down. They think that the ground floor is better for how they access their clients, and I think I agree with that. And then for tenant mediation or landlord tenant mediation and the uh, survivor resource room, I think we can, you know, use that room for those both those purposes because they, you know, the survivor resource aspect is on a need by need basis, and the tenant. So same with the tenant mediation. So we can um, we can work that schedule. And manage it ourselves, and it shouldn't be too hard. With you know, both will have maybe around 60 uses each a year, and so we just will have to balance all of those. So, if there's any thoughts, especially on the reception area and the community center idea, that's like a newer one. Diana and I talked about. But yeah, any. You know, I was thinking um, today actually that if we, you know, we <coughs> have like our, we we don't have very many closed sessions of the board. But I always kind of was uncomfortable when we did have a closed session at the last meeting and we had to kick everybody out of the room and then they have to go stand around outside and then come back. So, you know, like the Board of Supervisors, they leave the Board the board of Supervisors chamber and meet in a different room. So it occurred to me that upstairs would be kind of a nice place to go for a closed session meeting. That's then we can keep the public in the room. We could have more discretion to maybe do a short closed session at the beginning of our meeting, yeah. you know, and just take 10 minutes maybe if it's a short item. But I was just thinking that kicking everybody out of the room just doesn't seem very good for our public participation. Yeah. Um, I had one question which was uh, just on the, uh, the tenant mediation and uh, survivor resource center, which is I know in the past there was, I think, some desire for exclusivity in that room. and. We sort of, I think at this time, sort of talked about it and said, no, that's not really something that we want to do. We want to keep the options open just because of the volume. Um, but that's, you, do you foresee that being a, a conflict that arises? Not from what I've talked to with Sessa so far. Like, they're looking to keep it the way it is for the foreseeable future right now. Because I don't see them wanting to do anything more than well, on a case by case basis. I know that Students Against Sexual Assault has asked us in the past if they could do office hours kinds of things in those in the room and I think if we did want to accommodate that we could still do
do that and like you know restrict it to certain hours of the day where maybe tending media mediations might be less you know frequent and then uh, have the upstairs room also as like an over you know if we need if there's some day where everything's happening at the same time we at least have the upstairs room it's private to do the mediation and if we need to so it should be okay one thing that um, Father John and I had talked about a long time ago was the idea of having essentially like rotating service providers in our space. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, like we, we've ended up in a position where we've got semi-permanent semi uses of our space, such as um, uh, the AmeriCorps also. Yeah. And um, the, the idea that we might have like a, a pop-up location for um, a um, uh, something in County Public Health, for example, that wants to just use the, use the office space for a day. Um, yeah. And there's maybe Jay has some insight on this, but it seems like in the modern world of business, there's more shared space options where somebody doesn't need, oh, that's my desk, that's my yeah. workspace, that's where I am. And there's more, in the modern world, there is more shared workspace opportunities where, you know, you might have an intern today and a different intern the next day, and, mm -hmm. you know, it, people can can move around on workspaces as long as they're adequately set up for computer access and all the things they need, so. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I know you were mentioning, the reception area in the community center, I think it's a great idea. Um, we, I think, should check out the space. Have you had a chance to check it out and see if it's something that... We're not there yet, I've been yeah. playing too. Yeah. Well, I think it's not this coming week, but the week after when Joan and Gina said that we can start going inside. So it'll be one of the first things that Diana and I work on when we get in there is just taking measurements and seeing uh, what's possible in there. Okay. Um, one question I have is, uh, Jonathan, do you need us to, at a future board meeting, get some help for the office furniture assemblage? I already assembled the SRC furniture, or what? Oh, the, um, the, big the, the big desk. So uh, talking with Bob, he's think we were thinking that uh, we think we should bring the, the people back, especially since we might need yeah. to make modifications to the size and you know, the modularity of it. So Void so. seems to know how to put it together and take it yeah, apart. Yeah, they take or, it apart really quickly. Yeah, yeah, and they can put it, we, we try to put that back together. We won't be very successful. Yeah. So, and, uh, oh. so we can get you help on that quickly. Thank you, thank you. And we're, me and Guy, the guy who's head of it, we've been going back and forth and just He's sending us drawings of how the desk could look in our office, like different configurations, because it's just big enough. Like our office is almost like perfectly sized, but you know it might block the window or something. So I'm just trying to make sure it fits. Diana said maybe if we can slim it down, that could be the reception in the community center. I was like, I don't know. Well, I showed her the pictures. We will need to see what the size of the space is in there. So I think it should. It most likely end up in our district office, but if she's thinking like that's perfect for the community center, we'll. Yeah. Make it work. And if it does end up in the community center, then we certainly also need to get Figure better out, yeah. furniture in the office. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does how uh, this first time I've been in this building, how's the <coughs> programming in this building work? Um, so the I YMCA is like, they, they manage everything and they, they put on all the programming and there's, you know, study hours for the students to come in and recreation time and, you know, it's like a home base for when they do anything else. If they do a field trip, they like meet here. And yeah. So it's all students like K through 12? High school or mainly, yeah. Uh, through, uh, mm -hmm. through high school? Yeah. Okay. And that was one of those things that Jonathan and I have talked about um, we met when we met with who I'm a couple of weeks ago was doing a board meeting here that is um, sort of gives us an opportunity to hear from a lot of the kids that they serve um, just because, I mean, it is such a cool space. and. Okay. Um, yeah, for the record, huge shout out to the uh, YMCA for letting us use this space. It's awesome. Um, so I like I like the direction that you're going. You know, I think we had, had a conversation about maybe moving this office upstairs. Once you brought up that thing that we were talking about where someone said, well, the district office is already there. People are starting to know where it is. Why change it? You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it mm -hmm. kind of thing. And uh, that resonated with me. So yeah. I think it's better kept downstairs. All right, well, I'll bring something back once I get a chance to talk to the staff. Okay, very cool. So um, with that, we're going to skip uh, back up to item 3.1 uh, on the agenda.
This is a review of Government Code 61250. Um, so thank you, Ross, for joining us and for Sorry, preparing this presentation. Quick no, question. I'm do you want to do it on the TV with everyone on the couch, or they all have the printed version? Do you need a version to look at? I just need a version to look at, yeah. My computer's phone? Yeah. So if everybody has a copy, I can just use John's yeah. computer. Yeah. I'll take oh, no. notes. And if oh, you any like notes you grab like typing because it's faster. Okay. All right. So uh, a lot of what you all are talking about today is what to do, and I'm really always here, Will's here too, to tell you how the, the ways that you can go about doing those things, and uh, as is. It's laudable that so many good ideas come out of this board. Uh, I've commented to people individually that it's a very high-functioning board because of the level of engagement. Uh, it's a high-functioning board because of the you know, discussion points uh, that come out of uh, different agenda items. Uh, and it's tough to be the wet blanket thrown over all of these really great ideas when the question is tossed to me, hey, Ross, can we actually do these things? And I have to say, so sheepishly, no, uh, and there's a reason why, uh, and the reason all comes back to uh, what we're going to go over in the next uh, probably 30, 35 minutes or so. And if you look at the first slide after the, the title slide is statutory background between government codes uh, section 61250, which really lets everyone know if you look at those sections, and as I try to convey uh, during uh, meetings, uh, what the powers, what the limitations are of, of this district. But all is not lost. There are a number of areas uh, where the district can expand services that it's already providing, and expand into areas that it's authorized uh, to provide. And uh, there is a process by which the district can look at uh, activating what are called latent powers. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into that uh, as we go forward. So the statutory background, Obviously, it comes from AB3. Uh, I know a number of you were involved in that process uh, in getting that together. I'm not going to talk about that because if you need anybody to talk to you about AB3, you have an expert uh, uh, here with Jonathan. I am here to talk to you about uh, Government Code 61250 because in the end, that's the ultimate law that was, was enacted. So as a very basic concept, I think it will go a long way to understand <laughs> why it is that the district can only do certain things when the county of Santa Barbara can do different things, or the city of Santa Barbara can do different things, or the city of Goleta can do different things. And that comes back to the, this concept that the district is a creature of statute. It exists because there are statutes in California that say that it can exist, which is very, very different than a, a city or a county, which is a, effectively it is a political subdivision of the state. It is, a, it is as if the, the, the government of the state cleaved off part of itself and said, local jurisdictions, cities, and counties, you here have all of these enumerated powers that flow from the delegation of power from the people to the state and back down again. The district is not one of those creatures. It is not one of those government entities. Uh, it is governed by government code, specifically government code section 61,000, which is the community uh, services district law. Cities and counties have powers that flow from the, the, the California Constitution. And one thing that you hear me say from time to time is, no, we can't do that because the district doesn't have police powers like cities and counties do. That is a very shorthand way of saying that our power does not derive from the California Constitution, the powers of the district derive from these statutes, and we're going to go, go through them. Um, so the, the, the 61,000 series of the government code uh, sets forth community services district law writ large. That is, if a, a group of people want to get together and form a community services district, that is the, the section of the government code that you will look to. This district is a very special district. It's not just a special district. It's a very special district because of the way that it came into being. Uh, unlike other special districts, for example, another 
one of my clients, Los Olivos, where they went through the LAFCO process, that's a local agency formation commission. Uh, they went through that process to have LAFCO approve them being put on the ballot and then people voting and then it comes into existence by virtue of people voting. This district came into being by virtue of AB3, a legislative process. Uh, so it bypassed most of the, the regular LAFCO uh, process because of the way that AB3 was structured. And that whole, uh, by, uh, the way in which this district bypassed those provisions of LAFCO, it's in 61-250, you can read it. Is it, it laid out LAFCO, you do this, Santa Barbara County, you do this, and then ultimately it's being left to the voters. So it, this special district is special because of the way that it came about, uh, and also it has certain activated powers, but those activated powers have certain restrictions on them that are not typical for most special districts. And the big one, as you've heard me say time and time again, is that this is the only special district in California that has the ability to levy a utility user tax. That is a tax that is, up until the creation of this district, been the exclusive purview of counties and of cities. So if you look at 61250, it comes, it basically breaks down into what are the startup provisions that gets the district off the ground, what are the rules that have to be followed, and then what are the guidelines that have to be followed moving forward. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of the starter provisions, uh, but essentially they were, like I said, county board of supervisors, thou shalt do these things. Initiate the LAFCO process, county pays the fees, uh, and then it's a direction to all of the county officials uh, with respect to elections to conduct the elections on behalf of this as yet uh, non-existent uh, entity. It also set forth a number of directives to LAFCO, which had been an impediment to the creation of some type of local government uh, in this area in the past. And basically it said LAFCO, thou shalt complete a review of the county's resolution of application. You do not have authority to disapprove of the resolution. You do not uh, have the ability to have protest hearings. In fact, you must order the formation uh, and the submission of the ballot initiative to uh, the ballot. And you also have to set the initial uh, utilities that uh, to be taxed as well as the rate. So it took a lot of discretion from the LAFCO process and LAFCOs normally have that discretion uh, to be able to you know, complete these reviews and issue their opinions and guide the development process. But because of the complicated history of this region, AB3 was created to, to really go around uh, a lot of that uh, to guarantee that the people would make the ultimate decision as to whether this district uh, would exist or not. So obviously after that, you have the initial UUT the utility user tax being submitted with Measure F. You have Measure E, which is the creation of the district, 8% uh, on the utilities. As everyone knows by now, uh, it was close for Measure F, but it's failed because it needed two-thirds of the vote. So as a result, you had a year of living, living frugally. Um, you did as much as you possibly could with the little funding that you had, the commitments from UCSB with its strings attached, the uh, donations of very generous residents of the district. I'm not just casually pointing this way with my hands because there were people who gave money to the district to help it. Uh, there were people who committed lots of their own personal time. Uh, and in the end, we ended up with Measure R, a success. And now we've got uh, these utilities that are being taxed and we have money coming in. So br brief history now where we are. Powers and limitations. Okay. This is the good stuff. This is the meat. All the activated powers are found in 61 in fact, you're found in 61250D and 61250G. Now, if you look and if you read 61250 carefully, as I know that you all do, have, and will continue to do, you've got subsection D, which is the initial tax funding provision. It says the initial tax funding for the district shall go to the following things municipal advisory councils under a different section of the government code creation of a, a tenant mediation program. You can finance area planning commissions, but you can't create your own land use regulations. You have to still follow what the county has, but you can be able to have an area planning commission for more targeted 
uh, discussion of what land use development should look like within the confines of the district. You can also exercise the powers of the parking district, which is to say that this community services district gets to put on a different hat and act like it's a parking district under the parking district uh, uh, rules. And that's found in a completely different section of state law. It's in the Streets and Highways Codes. If you're looking for something to read late at night, you can't manage to find a way to fall asleep naturally. Uh, Streets and Highways Code 35,100 sets forth what the parking uh, district law is. And I think it dates back to the 1920s, 1921, I think is what it is. So real recent stuff. Um, contract for additional, and I put that this in parentheses and in quotes, supplemental police services. We're going to come back to that uh, from either the county of the UCs and also uh, acquire, construct, improve, maintain, etc. Uh, community facilities like uh, libraries, theaters, museums, etc. All of that's set forth in D1. The first thing is it says the initial tax shall be used for these things. Well, okay. So what? I also forgot uh, improving sidewalks, lighting, and gutters, and also abating graffiti. Well, the reason why there's a so what, or why you should be wondering about this, is because subsection G says that when the district is created, it shall have these activated powers. Some of these you'll see from the previous slide. Tenant mediation program, exercising powers of a parking district, contracting for additional supplemental uh, uh, public safety services with the county of the UCs. But now you have the first measure mention of the UUT. Again, that's unique. And then also you have this uh, maintaining sidewalks, lighting, gutters, etc. And then supplemental code enforcement services. Well, that's a new thing too. That wasn't in D1. So, hold up. You may be saying to yourself, Mr. Smart Pants Lawyer. <laughs> Those lists don't match. If you look at what D1 and G, and you hold them up to each other, you'll say, okay, things overlap, like tenant mediation, exercising powers of a parking district, contracting for additional uh, police services with the county or the UCs, and also acquiring, constructing, improving, maintaining sidewalks, lighting, gutters, and trees. That's found in D1 and in G. But when you look at it again, you also notice that Max, Municipal Advisory Councils are only in D1. Area Planning Commissions are only in D1. Community Facilities Operating, Maintaining, Construction, etc. is only in D1. And Graffiti Abatement is only in D1. And then you look and go Code Enforcement's only in G. So, what gives? Well, it's my opinion that that is the full scope of the activated powers of the district. Just because some happen to be in D1, also happen to be in G, and at least one that's in G does, is, does not show up in D1, and a couple in D1 don't show up in G. You don't have contingent activated powers under community services district law. You either have a power is activated, or you have it, it's latent, which means it hasn't been activated. Uh, it's out there. So, Initial tax sounds like it can only be used when it's this part, and, and what about over here? No, activated powers. It's my counsel, as your lawyer, is my position that the activated powers of the Isla Vista Community Services District are those as enumerated in one and in G. Because you don't have a contingent activated powers, um, that has to be true. Also, when you look at it from a legislative intent standpoint, the, the creators of AB1, of AB3, the whole intention was is to instruct LAFCO exactly what it had to do. So the reason why you have this carve out of initial tax powers, it's to instruct LAFCO on how to do its job. Essentially, because LAFCO is being taken out of the, of the process with respect to exercising its discretion, the drafters of AB3 needed to step in and tell LAFCO what it needed to do. And it needed to tell LAFCO that when you put the ballot measure together, you need to write these things because they're going to be on the ballot and the election code requires certain things to be on the ballot using certain language, 75 words, impartial analysis, etc. But at a baseline uh, proposition is the idea that, that the, the ballot initiative needs to list, uh, it needs to meet the ballot measure requirements and it has to uh, enumerate what those powers are going to be upon its initial creation. And another component 
issues, we, when we look at st statutory intent, is how can you harmonize different aspects of the law so that they make sense of one another? Courts don't like to look at a law and invalidate portions unless they can conflict with one another, uh, unless there isn't some type of support for one interpretation. They try and look at it as a whole. They try and find a way to make everything work with one another. The only way that you can do that is if you look at D1 and G and say this is the universe of powers that this district has. So I've gone through all that, but something to throw out there for you all to consider, uh, and maybe working with Jonathan as an expert on the EB3 process, and I know there are other people involved as well, but those are the types of conflicts that uh, allow people who uh, don't have a favorable position uh, towards the district to try and come in and kind of mess up what you're doing here. So what's the safest thing to do? Don't rely upon Trundle on the law, which is not citable in court. Uh, you can go and you can get the statute amended. The statute's already been amended with respect to uh, whether it's a conflict uh, for somebody on the county to uh, one of their deputies to sit on the board, um, making clear that all of the activated powers for the district are as found in D1 and G. It's a simple sentence that you can add as a subsection M, saying that all of the powers are, are as listed. I think it's just, it's a, you, you know, you're really belt and suspenders kind of a, uh, of a security at that point, but if you want to make sure, that's what you need. So, you know, okay, so I, I, I've given you my assessment on what are the powers? powers is listed in D1 and then the powers listed in G. That's the most holistic uh, approach. Jay. Do you want to wait until the end of the presentation before we make any comments or anything? Or if, like, if I've got something I want to Let's Let's to keep it to clarifying questions for now and then we can do comments after he's done the presentation. Sure. Okay. Alright. Um, I want to make a one quick note. If you look in your, I think this is the, maybe the ninth slide? It's on the one that says hold up. Those don't list, that, that list doesn't match this other one. And it says, a quick note on actions necessary and proper. There is a tendency by people to look at the list of powers and says, well, if it's not in this list of powers, then we can't do it. It's understandable why you might think that. But the list is not exhaustive. And there's this whole concept of uh, government entities also having an inherent power which is to say something that is not specifically enumerated, that they can do things to carry out the powers that they are specifically given. So when you have an activated power of treating wastewater, inherent in that is this notion that you can hire a general manager. In fact, there's another provision the government code says you should. But the, are, and then you can hire people to help carry out uh, the administrative aspects of supporting a district. Not everything that is necessary to carry out the power is listed in a government code somewhere or listed in the Streets and Highways Code. So you also have inherent in each of these activated powers the ability to carry out, uh, to do things that are necessary and proper to carry out this specific function. So don't get wrapped around the axle if you feel like you're looking at this and says, well, it doesn't say that we can do that. It's true. If, maybe that's true. It doesn't say that you can't do that specific thing. But the next question to ask yourself is, is what you're trying to do necessary and proper to carrying out one of your activated powers? If the answer is yes, then the chances are it's most likely an inherent power that you don't have to have a specific enumerated activated power in order to do. Uh, it's a little abstract, but I think questions that come later might flesh that out a little bit. So if we talked about powers, the question is now is where can you carry out those powers? And that comes down to what, uh, this is the slide on jurisdiction and boundaries. The jurisdiction, and if you like Latin, it's in the, that part of jurisdiction, juris meaning law, it talks about the extent of the district's legal control. The jurisdiction of the district, or the activated powers, it's the legal ability for them to do, for the district to do what it can do. Compared to the boundaries of the district, which is the geographical area of the district, obviously, which is coterminous with uh, uh, county service area 31 minus UC property. Jurisdiction talks about the extent of the district's uh, uh, legal control. Boundaries is a geographic term. 
right? So we talked about powers, we talked about jurisdiction, we talked about boundaries. Special um, districts. Sorry, uh, I just had one clarifying question yes. of, about the boundaries, just because I think this has come up a couple of times. So, um, the based on AB three, properties owned by UC Santa Barbara are not included. Is it the the boundaries of the district or those carved out properties at the time when the district was formed on the ballot or when LAFCO approved everything to go to the ballot, or is it if UC Santa Barbara uh, buys up a new property, then it automatically comes out of the district. If the way that it's written now is if UC Santa Barbara buys a property, it is not a part of the district. It's not within the district's boundaries. It, it, the, the language is exclusionary. It says okay. it is not included. There's no limitation on time. There's no limitation uh, on, on area. And that was also discussed at the time when that was added, and it was explicitly the, the intent also. I remember okay. that was what UC so, had wanted. So Good. just a so service area 31 if you see Santa Barbara owns a property in there they can be exempt from paying property tax okay. so the same thing if they buy a property in our district they're exempt from the utility user tax correct but it's my understanding that on some of their properties they're still paying property tax okay so does that mean that they shouldn't be paying our utility user tax if they didn't declare that property exempt and come off the tax roll? Maybe. I, I don't know. It depends on the specifics of, the, of, of what happened and why. Uh, I can tell you that from the way that the, the statute is written, that the UC properties are not within the, they are, they are not within the geography, they're not within the boundaries of the district, nor are they within the jurisdiction of the district, except as otherwise specified. For example, making a contract. Ethan? Yeah, and on that, I think um, you might be referring to the properties that were recently bought in the last few years, which are owned by the UC retirement system, yeah. um, which my understanding is they, uh, when they went in, intended not to take the properties off the tax roll. And it was the retirement system and not the local campus. Yeah. So one other uh, last question, I don't want to get too far off track of your presentation, um, but um, my understanding is utility user taxes are sort of like a, a surcharge fee in the eyes of the law. Um, do public agencies, are they liable to pay the UUT? Not usually. Not usually, okay. There are uh, typical exclusions for other government, for example, Los Olivos. Okay. Uh, there are, uh, there's a property on, there's a post office, it's federal government, you can't tax the federal government. Um, there's a school district, there's a provision of the law that says it's another public entity, they, they don't get uh, assessed. There's a property tax, not a utility user tax. Um, but typically there are exclusions in the, in the utility user tax that apply either because of uh, constitutional provisions or statutory provisions. Uh, that will control, and those, okay. that's what we look to. Okay. Just one more comment on if if, if it's true that the, the Calpers bought these properties, they're doing it as an investment, and therefore their eventual goal is they're going to treat these like the real estate investment trusts who bought Francisco Torres and eventually sold in the university. They're going to create a cap rate there. They're going to create high rents. They're going to improve the buildings. Then they're going to sell them to UCSB, and then they're going to come off the tax roll. But all during that time, they're getting an exclusion for paying the utility user tax too. The real estate investment trust is scalpers. I don't know if anybody thought that through when they gave the university their, their exclusion. All I do know is it's probably gonna happen a lot more in the future. They're not done buying up the community and it's to their financial advantage to buy the community. And, and because they're exempt from property tax and stuff. So I don't know, I, I just gives me food for thought about, you it's know. It's a great conversation to have with your state legislature uh, <laughs> in the area yeah. and you know, county board of supervisors. You know, those types mm -hmm. of questions the, the, if, to the extent that it impacts county policy direction, I mean, that's where it needs to go and to the extent that it requires some type of change in the law, you know, talk to your legislative representatives. They're the ones who are gonna be able you know, 
off, just off the cuff of what you say, they shouldn't be tax free in the meantime. Yeah. Just okay. But so last question on this is, um, so the properties owned by the UC retirement system, which are within the boundaries of the district, those properties, are they liable to pay the UUT or are they exempt? My understanding is that they, that the retirement system is not a separate legal entity. It's a part of the UC Regents. And, and to the extent that that is accurate, then they would be exempt. Okay. Thanks. So we talked about the boundaries, we talked about uh, jurisdiction, we talked about some of the history, and we talked about the powers. Unlike a lot of other, unlike any other special district, uh, there are specific quirks in 61250 that are limitations on activated powers. Normally, the limitations are, are as provided by some other type of law or, or a, a principle of, of constitutional interpretation. But here, in 61250, we have this edict, the district can supplement a service of another entity, but it cannot supplant. And those are interesting words, because what does that mean to supplement? What does that mean to supplant? And it's a little bit open to interpretation, but the basic idea is, is that if you are adding on to a, pri a service that's currently being provided, then you're supplementing it. If you are replacing a, a service, then you are supplanting it, and that's what the no-no is. So, supplement but not supplant in the other entities that are involved. County, CSA 31, IVRPD, UC Regents, and then any other agency or entity, unless you have written consent. So basically, are you improving, are you adding to, then you're supplementing, and you're okay. Are you replacing or getting rid of, then you're supplanting, not okay. A big, big thing, and this is a this is a, a, a pretty significant limitation looking at it from a, a governmental standpoint is the district does not have the power of eminent domain. It cannot condemn property for a public purpose. So you don't have that tool available to say, well, we're, we want to widen this road. We have the power to upkeep and to maintain and to improve roads. Well, the best way to do that would be to <coughs> eminent domain, get this sidewalk strip over here so we can complete the sidewalk and do that if you can. You just don't have that power. so got to get more creative in trying to come up with these these goals and how you're going to go about uh, doing it. Obviously, we talked about taxation, UUT. The thing I want to point out here is that taxation via UUT is the only funding mechanism. Other than the pledge from UCSB, you don't have the ability to go and get property tax revenue. Uh, that would, appears to be a conscious decision that was made in putting AB3 together. Um, you know, Part of the horse trading that was involved, I guess, but at least it's written the way that I read it, the sole funding mechanism for the district is the UUT, which is why Measure R was so important. One question on that is, um, so let's say in, in a hypothetical scenario, um, something like County Service Area 31, if we went through a process and the two, we were consolidated with CSA 31, it receives a portion of the property taxes, it also has a benefit assessment. Would those then become sources of our revenue? What I would argue is that the consolidation process would have to take into account the fact that CSA 31 is funded by property taxes and that there would need to be a reconciliation between the strict language in 61250 and the reality of CSA 31, which is a, a, a dependent special district. So it, in the reconciliation process, you'd have to be able to have a mechanism by which any of those property taxes that would flow to CSA 31 normally would instead come to. Can you explain that again, the, the restriction in 61250? 61250, the, the sole funding mechanism for the district yeah. in terms of taxation is the UUT. That, that at least is not the intent. Uh, and that is, I mean, like when we were talking about getting this set up, and I had a lot of conversations ourselves, the idea that we would be able to at some point in the future potentially go and get a property tax. Not that we had any particular timeline or, the, or reason why, but that was the, like an explicit thing that had been discussed is, is that we'd be able to go and get other forms of taxes. And that was, I believe, why also we've got things like this subdivision will not be construed to limit the services that may be funded by a tax, not a any particular kind of tax, but just by a tax imposed at a later date. But that's all within the context of the UUT process. That's why I say, at least as it, as it reads now, here's the point. I, I'm not here to win an argument one way or the other. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, 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 it's to explore yeah, that yeah, argument. Yeah, I wanted to come and, and, and make a legal argument to say that the district only has the ability to level the UUT. I think the statute supports that interpretation. 
I understand what you're saying. Yes. Well, there's this other language that says a tax in this. Yeah, I'm also I'm just bring up because it also was fascinating because the I mean, that was also something where um, some of the property owners, um, one in particular, had actually requested, like, it demanded that we have that power removed, and the negotiation went in such a way where it was like, no, we are not giving you that. Because, like, we are we are taking that power and running with it. So I'm then just, I then I yeah, think even more so that. than making clear the D1 and G and that you know, yeah, making so. clear what the powers are. I think that that's a more important one because well, so I so I, that, that's what I want to come up before. So actually, I went back because I was I was actually in shock at your D one and G thing. I had not I had never noticed the difference of the, the powers yes. that were removed from G yeah. that were in D one. And the reason why, and so I've been sitting here, I've been going through the history of the text, and um, there were there were some changes that were made while. Annoyingly, it was like after a lot of public sign off. I remember specifically, I was in um, Seattle and like frantically receiving and managing phone calls while I'm like down, downstairs, the space needle with Darcel being like, No, 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 you can't change that. You've got to change that. You can't change this. But they, the text used to say, The district shall have all the powers listed in section 61 100 except those powers specified in E and F. And then the next thing said, In addition to the powers that we just said, which are all powers, mm -hmm. The district may, within its boundaries, do any of the following, and it just had the the additional powers. Like this is what the replacement for what you would G's to say, mm -hmm. and then the the Darcel was messing with the text for the the um, the re restriction on the E and F powers, the the park district powers, and decided we should elevate that to its own special um, section, and struck the thing. I. I, this has got to be on accident. Just struck the thing that said all the powers listed in 61100 and moved that to a later thing. Because it was, it, was like, it was like a reference, right? Like that got moved to its own section. And then the, in addition to the powers there, it's like, I'm just like, I, I remember the intent of all of this. I remember dealing with all the lawyers who were dealing with all of this. Mm -hmm. And I remember the process, like the, the days on which this got moved. And this is. This has got to be a mistake. Like the the goal in G was to have all of the the powers that we had. So I don't know. I, mean, I, I feel like we we could go and get this fixed um, with relatively minimal conflict at the state level, since we can show the I mean, like. I mean, I, it's still available. Like, I can see the history of all the steps and like actually watch it yeah. accidentally get removed. Yeah, and, and, and as, a, as a quick side note into how this would play out in court, we would have to say first that the plain language of the statute is clear. It says what it says. If there's any ambiguity, if there's an any ability to argue two opposing viewpoints rationally and reasonably based on the text, then you get into the legislative intent, and then you, but that's a long process. If you have the ability to simply say, this is what we have now, and this is what we had before, and what we had before makes a lot more sense, or here's this provision that we could add to make what we had before make more sense in the context of this law as it's written, then definitely a legislative fix is better than a court because it will be mm -hmm. imprecise, it will be long in coming, and it will be expensive. So hit up your, your representatives and have them make that change because, again, just my, my observation in reading the law and you know, 16 years of being a lawyer, doing this kind of a thing, uh, I read it as the, the UUT is the only way to fund the district. Obviously, you have a commitment from UCSB with its strings, but that the taxing uh, power is limited to the UUT. And if there's any history that suggests that the UUT is to be an additional power, then I think the provision in the law that says that it has the power uh, to tax as set forth in 61,000, right, the CSD law, that would be really, really helpful for making that argument. But, but I'd be, you know, the whole point of forming a community services district was in the absence of you know, it's a it's a viable entity for this to have a representative government, and typically a community service district precedes a city. So they're usually formed, and then cities get formed afterwards. Buellton was a community services district that turned into a city. Yeah, know. I don't I don't think that that evolution holds as much now. I would say within the past, at least since two thousand, because that's when the 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 special districts really came under a lot of scrutiny. Uh, in in Illinois Empire, where I live and where I work, we had two cities, one of 65, 67,000, and another of almost 100,000 people. They went from county unincorporated areas to cities overnight. Yeah, but not all. But some, some sure. started out as more rural communities and then grew. Sure. But I always thought in the back of my mind, forming a community services district was a good idea because then eventually you might be able to 
be a successful community services district, have some extra funding from UUT, and then go to some of the other county services like street lighting and merge with that district and have the property taxes and the UUT to enhance lighting. Like it says, we can enhance lighting, but it, it seems like to have two different districts that never can come together. I don't, I wasn't thinking that the law ever restricted that, that we, it ever restricted us from going back to LAFCO or back to the state legislature if we have to and say, we want to, we want to have this merger either you know, with LAFCO's support and the other entity support and the county support, or force it through the legislature as a better form of government. I, I don't, you know, I mean, I, yeah. All I, I can say is that you know, might. That's the first time I've ever heard of that restriction that you couldn't do that. That's the way that I read the law. Again, it's turned on the law; it's as good as it goes. But uh, I mean, what, what if? What could we as? A, let's say that 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 a new redevelopment agency law came about and the legislature puts in there that we the community services district could with our boundaries form a redevelopment agency that would mean that we get property tax increment there's, is there's a provision in the law that says that the specific trumps the general so if you have a general law but then if you have a specific law that applies in the same area the specific law is going to apply in, mm -hmm. as it's as it's laid out so if you take that principle of specific Trump's general, the specific law for in 61250 about the funding of this district, it says a UUT. It doesn't say anything about property taxes, and in fact, it says nothing. It also, a collateral property impact is it says you don't have eminent domain. But if we had a bunch of willing partners re ready to do that, we could go to the legislature and sure. get it changed anyway. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and yeah, absolutely. And again, I, th I think that needs to be uh, one of our top priorities um, because even removing the whole uh, just the revenue side of things the the law that the charter special districts in the preamble describes the intent of the legislature that it finds that uh, districts that are uh, multi-purpose are preferable to a bunch of single use single service districts and and if, if that's going to prevent that from happening someday. If if we had a willing partner, um, like I use CSA 31 as an example, then that's that's a big problem. At, at a minimum, there's a benefit in having clarity and having it spelled out exactly what it was intended before, and not having it up to a bunch of lawyers to come out to side yeah. after the fact. Well, okay. What we saw on a practical benefit on a walk amongst the community, that it sure would be. Um, better to have the service area 31 being run by community members and people in the community than the county downtown that never gets out here at night and looks to see if the lights are even working sure i, I mean it's it's the whole so purpose I'm, of, I'm with i'm with you let's let's keep this going so yeah. that ross can finish up the presentation yeah, got um, it. yeah. And no, then we can, I, I, uh, I, I hear you have our line that sentiment question. flows a lot of times and you know from sacramento to everywhere else and then you know from a county to here etc uh, the last thing uh, on the topic of, of, of money uh, is that the thing to keep in mind is that for any service that you provide, you can also charge reasonable fees as long as those fees are tied to the service that's being provided and it covers costs only. It's not supposed to be revenue generating. It's supposed to be a, a cost offsetting. You still have the ability to charge, uh, to levy charges and fees for the services that, that are provided with the fees. So if you're looking at activating or uh, filling out an activated power, and you're like, well, how are we gonna pay for that when all of our UUT money doesn't cover that? The question is, are you providing a service for which some type of recovery can be had in terms of a, of a charge, et cetera? Does anybody know if this youth project's if YMCA charges a membership fee, or a, yeah, they, they do charge mm -hmm. membership fee, so people belong to it and pay? And is, it like 50, is it $50 a year? Yeah. Yeah. So to get everybody interested back in, except for the, policy wonks and the detail oriented like myself and Jay. Uh, what's the exciting thing to look forward to? Room for growth. Where Where is it that this, this district can go? What types of things can it look forward to in terms of uh, helping uh, move this community uh, uh, upward? And I, we really break it down into looking at what are your activated powers that you are currently using? How can you fully use the powers that have been activated? And then 
barring all of that, once you fill out all of those powers, well, what else can you go to Lapcon ask be activated? What are the latent powers? What's that process? So activated power is not in use. Um, I listed on, on this slide max, but a quick note on max. Um, municipal area uh, commissions, one, they come out of the county code. They're not something that comes out of the special district code. And as I think was discussed in the process of whether to uh, institute a MAC here, it, it came out as, well, isn't the purpose of a MAC to do what the community services district is doing? So I don't know if that discussion is still open or closed, but at least that's the, the issues that came up when it came up. <coughs> Area Planning Commission. Okay, so you can't make your land use regulations, but you can fund have an area of planning commission to go back to provide specific guidance to the county on zoning uh, and, uh, and, and, and building and planning types of issues. Why is that important? Well, I think this district is pretty well aware of the fact that in places that are only supposed to house eight people, you've got 16 people jammed in there. The ability to more effectively the ability to provide more targeted guidance to the county on how to carry out its planning and zoning and building process might have a lot of value in terms of providing a direct conduit from the people living here to the people making the decisions who don't. Uh, so area planning commissions, that's, uh, they are governed by 65101, uh, if you want a specific site what you can look at. Again, the limit there is that you have to work with the county on the areas and how it's all going to be carried out. Ross, one quick question sure. on that. So it's uh, work with the county on area and powers. So um, do different area planning commissions, they're granted different powers or Yeah, it's, it's kind powers? of like the neighborhood council system in Los Angeles. I think that's the easiest way. Uh, the lo those local councils don't have any more power except what's been delegated to them. Mm -hmm. But what they're really doing is to try and make sure that all of the issues for that geographical mm -hmm. area are being are being collected, being gathered up, okay. people are being heard, and then those are packaged and sent up to the district office for the, the council member. But no area planning commission is like the same because they and rely they on reflect each, each community that okay. they are they are set up to uh, provide oversight okay. for. Okay. Um, unlike an area planning commission where you've got to work with the county on the areas and the powers and et cetera, the parking district. You you are effectively, as a community services district, also a parking district. Because of the way that the law is set up, it says this district can operate as a parking district as set forth in the Streets and Highways Code. So that has everything to do with parking. One of the questions that came up one point about, well, can we have the sidewalk as part of you know, in the, uh, as a facility that's connected to the parking lot? In my opinion, at that time, was yes, because that is one of those necessary and proper things in carrying out one of your activated powers, which is acting as a parking district. So yes, you can do something to the sidewalk that is the means by which people access the parking lot. That, this is all hypothetical at the time, but you know, those are the types of uh, uh, necessary and proper or ancillary uh, or inherent powers that come along with that. But uh, as a parking district, you can create, implement, enforce parking restrictions uh, you can also create improvements to support parking within the boundaries of the district. That's a pretty big deal uh, in this area where you can't park on the street uh, for 10 months out of the year. Uh, how that is all implemented, it's all set forth in the parking district law. Uh, there's a lot of power that's in there that hasn't been touched yet. Uh, code enforcement. Uh, a key term here is that his Ross, is a supplement. Do you know if the, is the parking district law progressive or is it just old. It's old. It's old. It's old. It's like almost 100 years old. And, and there are a couple different versions of, of, there are different parking district laws, right? This and one, no, there's a specific reference to the parking district law as set forth in 35100, which is the yes. parking district law of like 1921. But there's, <laughs> other, there's others that are parking district law of 55 or whatever. Uh, I think what they did is, I think that the provisions, when they updated the parking district law in the 50s, I, I want to say that that was subsumed into 35100. Okay. But it's still old. It's still, uh, you know, you talk about an area of the law that could use an overhaul if it had, you know, time, attention, and money. That would be one of them. It's just that being said, it is the law. It's a power that's out there, and there's a lot of ability to impact uh, residents in a positive way with respect to all of those areas that fall under the parking district law. 
Uh, code enforcement. This was something that came up at one point, um, I want to say last summer. Uh, caveat number one, this is to supplement the county the, uh, or the Department of Planning and Development, um, which is to say you cannot replace it, but you can add to it. Uh, under code enforcement, it's not just, it's also zoning enforcement. Zoning enforcement is a little bit different than code enforcement. Um, I head my firm's uh, code enforcement division, so all the laws that uh, our clients are looking at passing in terms of adding to code enforcement, how code enforcement is carried out, and then executing on code enforcement, prosecuting it as a city prosecutor, or going after uh, uh, blighted properties in a civil capacity, whatever it is. So you've got enforcing laws like don't leave your trash cans out where they're visible, uh, clean up junk trash and debris on your property, make sure your weeds aren't creating a fire hazard. That's code compliance, code enforcement. Zoning enforcement is a little bit different because now you're talking about things like, well, you're in an R1 zone, you're in an R2 zone. That allows this type of redevelopment and occupation versus this one over here. Well, if your R1 zone it covers the 6700 block of Trigo and it says it's R1 maximum density is going to be eight people, you got 16 people, well, arguably that zone you're not operating in compliance with the zoning requirements for that. Or you're trying to do something in a zone that that zone doesn't permit, like run a business. Uh, you can run a business in a C1 zone, but you can't run it in an R2 zone, those kinds of things. Uh, again, working with the county, there is a whole <laughs> compliance and enforcement mechanism uh, or structure in Chapter 35 of the county code. And then building enforcement, which is a little bit different than zoning enforcement, because now you're talking about uh, in order to cram 16 people into a house that is only designed to fit eight, you put in walls. You put in illegal, sub uh, illegal improvements. Uh, you uh, convert a garage into a two bedroom uh, and add that on your property. Those are the types of issues that the building officials who come in who are engineers will say, that's not safe. This, this type of structure was not designed with human habitation in mind. And just because you throw up a couple of walls and put up the drywall, paint it and put in sockets, then you can't, you can't necessarily have somebody live there because it's not designed from its intention from when it was originally uh, approved for human habitation. So making sure that, that building issues uh, go to the right people, uh, that's set forth in chapters 10 and 14 of the county code. And again, that's a supplemental uh, uh, power. Hey, Ross, does so, that... Does that um because the county is so large, when they if if they we tried to do anything for stronger code enforcement or zoning enforcement in the Isla Vista area, is that affect is 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 what the county can do affected by what they're what they do in other areas too? Let's say they go in and they enforce zoning regulations or building codes here and don't do it in other parts of the county? Ultimately, that's county's discretion on how they carry that out. The, I, the point, the way that I read the law is that this district, in partnership with the county, can say, you have these powers. We want to see them carried out here, and we want to have them carried out specifically the, in these ways with respect to code enforcement, building enforcement, and zoning enforcement. So whether the county does it or doesn't do it in some other community within the boundaries of the, the county is up to county discretion. Yeah, I but thought they ran into that. These are specific mechanisms for this body to say, county, you have this power, and we want you to exercise it here, here, and here, and here's how we're going to help you. Here's how we're going to pay for it. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah, but I, I, I watched this with the Airbnb thing, and it seemed like, you know, the county couldn't use its discretion in specific areas on where to um, outlaw Airbnbs. And therefore, you know, they pretty much outlawed them everywhere. Well, I, typically when that, that type of an issue comes up, it's that it's a lot more complex than everybody makes it out to be in the beginning. There are groups that say, Airbnbs, I'm exercising my property rights, I should be able to do it wherever I damn well please. And other people say, yeah, as long as you don't do it next to me. And nobody can figure out a middle ground in you know, the, the, the five meetings where it's been brought up and they're being yelled at by their constituents on both sides. So what they do is they go, nobody gets anything. We're gonna put a moratorium on this. 
Nobody gets anything. We're going to hold the status quo until we figure out what the hell's going on. Well, that's where I think they go with zoning and, and, and building enforcement. Oops, we can't figure it out. We can't go do this, some enforcement out in ID and not do it anywhere else. No different than growing pot. Well, you know, no different than. And that's going to be the part of the process of yeah. deciding, you know, how about how to go about using these enumerated powers in partnership with the county. Uh, yeah, and, and a similar type of a situation may come up with respect to community facilities, which is the next slide, full use of activated powers. <coughs> community facilities are described in 61250 as community center, library, theaters, museum, cultural facilities, child care facilities. You know, these are things that are owned, maintained, programmed by the local government for the benefit of the community. But community facilities are not necessarily just those enumerated things because a community center, some cities have pools. They have, a, they have a city pool, or they have a, a, a CSD pool, or they have some other type of facility that is intended to benefit the, the residents of the community. So it doesn't necessarily have to be one of these things. It can be other types of uh, buildings, other types of facilities to promote the, the types of powers that are activated uh, right now. Ross, a question on this. So sure. um, a, is a, a park is considered a community facility? It is, but parks are carved out because parks are the responsibility of I IVRPD. Okay, so if there was, um, I'm just thinking in the context of, um, we, we've talked a little bit about trying to make uh, Deltovia something that's more organized and safer. Mm -hmm. So would would it, what would your opinion be on a, uh, a temporary um, community facility use agreement with an organization like Brecken Parks? Sure, I think that's perfectly in line with the powers that, okay. are, that are listed because you have IDRPD saying these are our parks, we, we have the authority to regulate how they're used and how they're not used. CSD says, hey, community facilities, why don't we enter into an agreement with IDRPD to use their park for a community event? Community events is nowhere found in 61250, but it's certainly within the ambit of what pro providing community, if, like the programming that you put in a facility is not specific to 61250. But it's certainly an anticipated ancillary and inherent notion in if you have a facility, you have the power, which is necessary and proper to carry out your power of the community facility to program how it's used. Okay. So we've had that a couple of times. And you also have in there a requirement that thou shalt not do anything with others' property without their permission. Well, if you do a temporary you know, community service permit or whatever you want to call it, you have all three of those things acting in concert to provide a community benefit that's consistent with the restriction for IDRPD having over their parks, the power to have community services, <coughs> community facilities, and making sure that you don't do it in a way that infringes jurisdiction or you know, property interests. Thanks. Do the do the county parks that are here also get into that exclusion? Because there are Ivy Reckon Park District parks and there are county parks here. Oh, but they but they are uh, managed they, they're managed and maintained by IVRP. Yeah. Some are. Well, Walter Caps Park is not maintained by anybody, is it? On paper. It On yeah. <laughs> On paper it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, but yeah. I'm saying there are county parks out here that supposedly are maintained by, you know, Ivy Rec and Park, but they're open lots. If it comes back to that on paper, IVRPD has responsibility for it, then that's what governs. Okay. Well, whether you like it or not. Well, we can take it away. Huh? The county could take it away. Sure, the county can take yeah. it away. Okay. okay. Has, has the We're going to Ethan. Thank you. Um, so one question I have, um, so Spencer, you illustrated an example of like a temporary use in collaboration with the park district. Um, say if a future park district board comes to a future board of this district and they want to do something like uh, build a skate park in a park um, and they see, oh, maybe the community services district wants to help on this public facility project. Um, if there's an agreement between the two districts, is the CSD allowed to do something like that that's yeah. more permanent? Yeah. Okay. You'd have to have an agreement. So when there's an agreement, we can get around the part of the law that says that the park district does everything parks. My understanding is that this is part of the discussion for IVCSD coming into existence. There was this notion that IVRPD has been here since the 70s, and it is not the intention to for a CSD to come in and to simply just replace IVRPD. Yeah, but if IVRPD and its elected members decide that the best way to carry out their mandate for taking care of recreation parks in the district 
is to collaborate with the CSD to build a skate park. Well, and that's why their elected officials are elected. And it's simply IVRPD carrying out their their powers and their mandate and by their voters and CSD doing the same by its own, which overlap <laughs> right. okay. to, to do something in partnership. That's perfectly within okay. the, the confines of the law. Great. Okay. Uh, okay, so I actually have one slide left. Uh, special powers, I talked about this, I've been talking about it a lot, activated versus latent. This is the second to last slide. Um, if it's activated, that means just that. It's active, it's active, you can use it. Latent just means that it's available, but it isn't activated. Uh, you can go and you can request that LAFCO uh, activate it. That process is all set forth in the government code uh, and that uh, at 61,100. 61, and for IVCSD, the specific provisions are 61,250H and L. Uh, it says you can go and you can ask LAFCO for more. There are 29 listed powers on, on the latent side. Uh, some of those examples, Jay probably knows very well from his barnstorming of the county uh, in becoming the LAFCO uh, member. Uh, supplying water, anything having to do with water, anything having to do with uh, sewage or solid waste, fire protection, police and security, uh, electric and communications facility, EMT or medical emergency uh, uh, services, public airports, transportation services, weed and roach, abatement, animal control services, cemetery services, habitat mitigation and conservation. That's broadly the areas that are available. Uh, and because of those are all the powers, so sometimes you get um, cemetery districts. That's all they do. That they carry out a very specific provision of the code about the uh, disposition of human remains in the confines of a burial place. Uh, or like Los Olivos, they are a CSD, but their uh, charging power, their activated powers, is everything having to do with wastewater. Uh, I, Got another uh, special district that it's actually it's an irrigation district which has its own little you know special carve out in the water code. So special districts can do one thing or it can do a lot of different things and essentially be a city in the number of services that it, it provides. So if you fill out everything that you have the power to do now, all of your activated powers, you go to LAFCO, you fill out a bunch of paperwork, you harangue people to vote your way, and in the end you can have more powers activated to do more and more things for uh, the community. So special thanks to, uh, to Will for helping me put together this slideshow and for uh, being here today. And any other questions that I can answer now that I'm probably 20 well, minutes over my I think you're, yeah, time. Jonathan, first, how are we on time? We're at 2.30, so we are a little over, but okay. we can make do. I'm, I'm thinking some other sections can be more Okay, sounds good. Um, I just had one more question, which is um, I know that there is a court case going through right now. I think it's the city of San Francisco that has to do with the threshold for voter approved taxes. Um, are you familiar with that? And um, I'm not, but I always okay. have a, whenever anybody says, well, in San Francisco, I say, whoa, 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 you gotta stop. <laughs> San Francisco is, it's a unique animal along the spectrum of why this is a unique uh, San Francisco is the only consolidated city and county. Okay. So it operates it, op it operates in both spheres at the same time. And so it's got the, the biggest uh, it's got the biggest plate of options at the buffet of, of governmental power because it gets to draw upon those provisions in the Constitution related to both. Uh, it's got a carve out in everything. So you know when you're looking at anything having to do with uh, uh, the threshold, like right now, I think ACA 1 is probably, I mean, John wanted me to talk about this later, but um, I think ACA 1 would amend that threshold down to 55% instead of having it be two thirds. Because 55% mm -hmm. is the level that uh, education uh, school districts, school districts have, have had for their bonds and for their financing. Uh, and all other public entities have had the two thirds majority. So ACA 1 would amend the Constitution specifically provisions in Article or, uh, Amendment 13 uh, B and Amendment 13 D, I believe, that would change that threshold from two-thirds requirement, uh, general or special taxes, down to 55%. So it's just a little bit more than simple majority, but obviously not a, a two-thirds super majority. Okay, sweet. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, this has been a really good presentation. Um, I... I really appreciate you uh, being able to break all this stuff down. I think that my final thought would be is just when you're looking at what can you do as a director, 
what can you do in talking to your colleagues on this board? And, and I've got this great idea and I want to be able to do this. My goal is for you to be able to look at this presentation and go, it's within, it, look at what you want to do through the lens of this presentation, the lens of these powers. And if it's not something that you can do, can you change it a little bit so that it comes back within, or do you really need some type of a legislative fix, or do you need a LAFCO process, or you know whatever it is? So hopefully this will help and guide you from ideas to action. Okay, Ross and William, thank all you so right, much. Stuff my face, so I'm not going to talk. <laughs> all right. Um, so with that, um, I think we are going to go uh, straight into item three point two. Was there any public comment on this? Um, is there any public comment on the site? I've got a question. It, I got the sense from your remarks that in in your in your sense there is there is no creature like a contingent power. But if there were, uh, what what would what relationship would that have in the universe of power? And what would it be contingent on? Well, I, and that and that really illustrates the, the problem with that as a, as a legal concept because the way that the, the laws are written, it's either you, here's everything that you, you can do, and either you pluck it out of that as a possibility and you make it a reality, or you don't. But you can't have, at least not the way that the law is written now, um, you would have this really strange situation where you'd have a power that's only active under certain conditions, and if those conditions are met, then it's no longer active. Well, who decides if those conditions are met? What's what's the metric by which compliance is measured? I, I think that really illustrates the, you know, the, the the type of problem, and I think it just further strengthens at least my position that it's either a latent power and it's available, or it's an active power and you're doing it. But to have something in between, it's just from even from a practical standpoint, how would you even go about dealing with that? So so we have, in your view, is it accurate or is it um, correct to say that we have the eight enumerated powers uh, as active powers? Right. And uh, the other 29 are late? Correct. Okay. okay. Good question. I saw everyone kind of nodding along. That's good. Very cool. Be better nodding along than nodding off. Yeah, but there's, there's one more power that's not listed in the eight or the 29, and that's code enforcement. Do you consider it active or late? It, it, it's active. Active. Interesting. Okay. But it's conditioned. But you don't believe in condition. No, I do. Oh, okay. Sort of. <laughs> sort of. No, okay. All right. <laughs> no, it, it's, oh, it's contingent. It, it, it's tangent. It's contingent. It's it's limited because it's not an un, it's not an unrestricted yeah. thing. So, I mean, it may even be a misnomer to have a say. Well, you have code enforcement powers. Like, well, code enforcement isn't necessarily a power. It's more of that necessary and proper because if you can do these things over here then it isn't inherent in that, the ability to make sure that those conditions are met. So I think when it comes to the code enforcement, it's saying it's not so much a power maybe as it is an area of responsibility that normally falls to the county, but you guys are going to get money, and if you feel like the county isn't doing its job, well, you can incentivize the county to come over here by waving some money in front of their noses and saying, here, here's our problem, fix it within this you know, this schema, this, this rubric. Um, quick question on that. Uh, that just jogged my memory of a conversation I had with someone from AS who had mold as his issue. And what was the issue? Mold. 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 Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a, you know, a code issue. Mm -hmm. And we have the C-Click Fix app, and he was asking how would, we were talking about like how would us putting that as an affordable item to forward to the county, would that fall within something Yes, you can report all this to us this way. Well, and this is that, that's in answering that question, I will toss back to Jay and say this is a good example of your power is, power is to say, county, we have these problems here, come and fix them. So the first mechanism always is go to your lease. Your lease doesn't allow for that. It's a health it's a health. It impacts the habitability of, of the property. So that's step one. Step two, they come to us and they say, look. Here's a picture of mushrooms growing in my, my bathroom. Um, not the good kind. So <laughs> what are we going to do? What are you going to do about that? Under this schema, there, you would have a basically like a bat phone. And you would 
hey, we have a we have a fifty thousand dollar line of communication between us and the county that says we've got a report of mold. Send somebody in to do something about this, as opposed to having a, a fully activated power. They send you the C-click fix, and they go, hey, can you do it? And you send out your contracted for or your district employee to go and abate the problem. That would be the, an illustration of the distinction. Excellent questions. OK. Well, this has been very good and informative and a lot for us to uh, chew on mentally and I think a good way to frame some of our later discussions because it really gets at what we uh, can do, what we can't do, uh, our limits, our opportunities. So this has been great. Thank you again, uh, Ross and William, for that presentation. Okay, we're going to move on to item 3.2, a review of the Isla Vista Redevelopment Agency and related efforts. So great. should I toss this to you? Or? I can open it, and then Bob, you want to follow? Yeah, I'll, I'll just put in a few comments. We don't have to spend a lot of time on it. but Yeah, the, the idea of this, and I think it's been brought up at a couple of our board meetings already, is you know, the RDA used to do all these things, um, and it was a funding source to do all these things, and none of these things technically are, you know, there, there's no house for them, uh, for the smaller ones and the bigger ones. And so what, some of the attachments that you had were in 09 to uh, 2011, some accomplishments, some goals, the audit annual report, only the end part is kind of like the fun programs that were put in place, like the facade improvement or the outdoor dining and then the last attachment is the County of SD funding study, which was kind of, it, I read it as like a post-mortem of the RDA. Of, the RDA is gone and there's all these services still left to uh, fund that might have been in the pipeline, but there's no responsibility for them anymore. Some of them do relate to our powers already, some of them don't. Uh, so I had some discussion questions uh, to just guide the conversation just because I'm not, I, I hope everyone had a chance to review uh, so, if anyone has like, questions before we do these discussion questions I just had for the group, just so we can inventory some of the positives and negatives you all glean from all of this. Uh, but before that, I'll see if Bob wants to say anything. Yeah, so the, a couple of things that, that just have been bugging me about, you know, our existence and then the redevelopment agency going away are you know, three of the biggest thing, three of the biggest entities that the county received as a benefit, oh. not as a benefit for the redevelopment agency, but inherited, was the solar parking lot, the community center, and in our building. And so, I just want people to understand. They keep they keep saying, "Well, that's the county's building, and the county's making some money off those projects." And so, there's this reluctance to say, "Oh, there's." those are kind of the county's buildings and, and they're making a positive benefit. But I just want everybody to understand when those buildings were purchased, it comes from tax increment that came from all the agencies in the districts that didn't have pass-through agreements. And 50% of the money that we got, the $45 million that we spent, actually came from the school districts. K-12 schools put in over 50%. People like Kalina West Sanitary District um, contributed. The Ivy Park District, they got a pass-through. They didn't contribute. The General Fund contributed. The Flood Control District contributed. So all that increment bought these buildings. And we did it the right way. The reason we got the buildings in the parking lot is we bonded those 10 years before the redevelopment agency, um, w before the re redevelopment agency was, was um, taken away. And in the end, we still today are collecting increment from those taxing agencies to pay off the bonds. And so the county's not paying off those bonds, it's the tax increments to pay off the bonds. As the bonds are paid off, the taxing agencies that didn't get the money are now getting money back. And so their, their taxes that used to go pay for this infrastructure are now going back to those taxing agencies. And when the county says, well, we own those buildings, yes, technically the state gave them the buildings. But I just want people to remember, 
the community bought the darn buildings out of their tax increment. And if, as long as the county has the attitude that these are the community's buildings and the solar lot is the community's lot, you know, I think that that's an important thing for the county to remember so that when we say, hey, we're in a position, we'd be better to run these at the community level or run the solar lot and use that maybe a little different than the county's using it as just public private. They're just doing public private parking and making money. And the question is, are they taking the money they're making and keeping it to put it back into the lot or are they using it for countywide uses? And all I'm thinking is, you know, this money in the redevelopment agency was feeding back into the redevelopment agency and keeping programs going. And so the other thing is there are some other small programs that are still making money today that the county's getting the money, but the question is, they're not doing anything with the program. But you use the car share program today. The IB redevelopment agency started car share. They got some, you know, they, they, they got some parking spaces, the private sector's paying the rent on those parking spaces, but it's it's not like the car share program's going anywhere or that there's car share, you know, spaces over in our solar parking lot that you, you know where to go pick up one of the cars. So anyways, there's just a lot of little programs here, you know, like facade improvement that we could put some money into if somebody mm -hmm. wanted to really improve their their facades or you know, solar street light demonstration project, still a viable idea. You know, the car share program. Um, you know, hey, maybe we want to buy a property and support affordable housing and get a developer to come in and do it. I, I don't know. I'm just saying I don't see a lot of the good ideas that came out of the IV redevelopment agency. Because the way the county is organizing, it's so huge they don't get the focus on, on and i was telling joan this the other day we had a crew of people that worked the redevelopment agency every single day you know two full-time high-powered people we had you know i jumped in there with mark paul and we didn't work on it every day but we really helped it out with some high finance we could go into the auditor's office and get technical help all the time and so we were able to do this really great stuff. And, and I'll, I'll give all the credit. It was really Jamie Goldstein and, and Jeff Harris. They, they led the efforts and were the brains to that thing. And, you know, they brought the packs along and we really got stuff done. And so I'm just saying now that it went away, I, I sitting on our board, look at the community and say, hey, the community center, the health building, and, and that solar lot are, are the communities. And, and eventually it'd be nice if we were the entity that ran those as community assets and invested and reinvested. And especially if we take over, do something innovative in parking, it'd be nice if that solar lot was our, the hub of our parking program, you know? Moving, I, I go, we took out the corner, the, the you know, where the, the benches were and stuff, I go, oh, why don't we put some electric bikes for rent in there or long-term electric bikes or something, you know? Anyways, that's all I got to say about redevelopment of, yeah. it, it, you know, Joan was saying, hey, why don't you guys do something like Los Alamos and bring the business community along? I go, well, number one, we're not Los Alamos. Number two, I've seen that, I didn't tell her this, I've seen it tried many, many times that we think People will come to Isla Vista for food. No, nope. we got a ton of students out here that will come to Isla Vista for food. We have that captive audience, but those are the people we want to cater to. And that's where we were going into, you know, with outdoor dining, we were helping the business community on Pardal. We were pushing those local programs, you know, the 70 bike racks that we put out there. So we were really focused on how to make that better rather than thinking we could do some businesses like are in Los Alamos that every time they do it, they fail. Because really what you're doing is selling food to students out here and some businesses do it really well. <laughs> Anyways, that's enough of mine. Thank you. Uh, I think so. Yeah.
we want to take public comment at the end. We can, we can take a question for public comment. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, I really, there's a lot um, of improvements on Cardall and General Loop that I, I really thought were real improvements. And uh, I guess I have a concern that a lot of them have fallen into disrepair and uh, need to be looked at again. For instance, uh, uh, Garbage receptacles that and recycling the receptacles where the lids are missing or the inserts gone. Um, uh, bike racks where like the Domino's 18 wheeler gets back and into them and at the front of the co op. Um, <coughs> you know, it, so they could stand, uh, they could stand some love. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. That's why I think I bring up we did a lot of good stuff in the redevelopment agency. And my total worry is now that it's gone, and we are we are really had momentum with four and a half million dollars a year. Um, that was a real, I, and, and I know what, how this stuff gets run down because it's a really active out here, and you know we have a little bit of money to help it out. So how can we make a difference and maybe pick up on some of these projects and may, maybe it's a good investment for us, but. You're the second meeting in a row I've heard about the garbage cans. Yeah. <laughs> and I've also heard about them from the third district supervisor's it's office. Issue. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an issue that- um, yeah. That uh, doesn't go away. That, that hasn't gone away. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, and I know um, one of the things that we found when we were doing uh, research in regards to the street lighting negotiations that we've had with the county is that um, there was previously lighting that the RDA put in, at least on part all down lighting on tree trunks that was just taken out and you know removed because they just said, well, we don't want to be bothered to maintain this. And so that's one of those things where it just really goes to show the, the benefit that you know a, a local agency would have at being able to make sure that those things are kept up and maintained rather than just you know, getting along to go along and going through the motions, which kind of feels like is the county's attitude with a lot of things. So a couple questions for the group. So in, in all these materials, did anything else stand out to anybody in terms of, you know, great idea that should continue? It was also, this was the, the infrastructure needs and the service needs of this one I thought was especially interesting. It lists basically 90% of the things we've ever talked about. Uh, but anything stand out to anybody? Well, one thing I thought about is, um, so I now know that County Public Works has this program which um, is kind of not advertised too much, but they do some cool work where they offer residents in the unincorporated area a chance to improve the sidewalk in front of their house where the resident pays, or homeowner, property owner pays half and County Public Works pays half. I'm not sure if that's something we've ever thought about here in terms of our sidewalks. If we had property owners who don't have sidewalks in front of their houses um, that want them there and we do some cost sharing. That was one thing I thought about just in terms of infrastructure improvements. They have this same program on street trees. So they'll yeah. come out, if they take out your tree, they, if you pay half, they pay half, they'll put in a new street tree. I had a question on uh, one of the things I noticed in, um, I think it's the audit of the RDA, which is the, uh, what's it called, Isla Vista Housing Fund. Um, I guess my question is just uh, like an overview exactly of how that, how that works. So 20% of all the tax increment, at one point it was 25, 20 or 25, uh, we varied it. Of all the tax increment, let's say, at the current level, it was four and a half million. Twenty-five percent of that, or twenty percent of it, was going to the housing affordable housing fund, mm -hmm. and that is how we built. Um, what's the Pescadero lofts? Pescadero lofts, and we and you can go through here and see. We would um, work with the affordable housing department to do other kinds of projects, and so most of the affordable housing that was built in Isla Vista got funding from um, the uh, Isla Vista community, the, the redevelopment agency. And so that source of doing affordable housing out here also dried up, so. 
Well, and it seems like if the redevelopment agencies are going to get brought back, affordable housing is going to be uh, an even bigger part of uh, Pro problem of that law, just given the uh, the situation that we have here now. Jake. One thing that's uh, it's come up at a few of our meetings, the, the idea of, of either being supportive of new redevelopment agencies or, or things like that. Um, well, one thing that I, 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 I want to make certain everyone has seen is in the materials, the master plan is one of the things that Jonathan threw in our pile of things, right? So you look at the box, and this is a subtle thing, that's why I bring it up. Is my own. The, you look at Isla Vista, and Isla Vista is this box. But the redevelopment project area was this box plus this red box up yeah. here. Mm -hmm. And that red box on the Isla Vista master plan map has almost nothing in it. But if you were to look, you know, um, nowadays, it's filled with houses. And that was all housing that was built when I was a student between 1999 and 2002. And, the, um, that, that I, and, and because of, it was specifically the timing of that, I, I happened to know that the, the houses there cost, were, when they were first put up, were being sold at about $300,000 a house. And now, I believe they're worth over a million dollars a house. And so a very large amount of our property tax increment was from this area that actually is now in the city of Goleta and is not, yeah, something that we would not really get again if we were to try to construct a new RDA. Um, and again, and, 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 and get again, even if we included in such an area, it was the fact that it had gotten built from nothing to houses that were worth so much money. And so. It's, uh, we, we were we were living flush on on a lot of funds. That but but the, but the but the, a lot of the increment did come from the existing structure as it was improved and turned over. If you look at when, you know, some of the bigger projects sold, they sold for a lot of money, and there's real estate investment trusts were coming in and buying up that student housing, and then improving the property, capitalizing it, and then selling it off. And so, you know, there was a great, not only, you know, they on purpose drew that box oh, yeah. around there and developed it to try and spur on the redevelopment agency. When they formed the redevelopment agency, though, it was for the purpose of buying open space and stopping development. That's, that's why they formed it. And, you know, we bought the bluff top properties and we bought other vacant lots that were called Measure T lots. And it was to stop development, not, you know, cause developments. But then, you know, the private sector bought um, Francisco Torres, and they redeveloped that, and they sold it to the university for a huge amount of money. But in the meantime, we collected, you know, a ton of tax increment off Francisco Torres before it sold. And so the whole community blossomed. It just, like, mushroomed in terms of the value of what the real estate in this community was. Interestingly, though, Francisco Torres is also in the red box, yep. not in the yellow box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't. I don't think the county ever thought that the university would do what they did today. Oh, but yeah. hey, that was a freak incident when it happened. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so well, it seems like uh, we've got some good takeaways from this uh, that are over here. I, I just um, think if if you're a board member and you go back and say, well, how can you? If, are there things? Just keep these lists kind of handy and say. Oh well, what, what what would we want to embark on any of these things to, you know, continue to make part all better or listen to the community? Hey, maybe we should invest in the new trash cans, and you know that's part of our beautification project. And maybe we can put better trash cans in that are more manageable. Or what was the guy's idea that came in and we put the beer can crusher in there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fun thing. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, this has been a great overview. So next one is review of other public agencies serving Isla Vista. And so you got the, um, it was a government option study that had specific pages that just highlighted the other agencies serving Isla Vista. So you had the special districts on one end, Glida Water, Glida West, Sanitary, IVRPD, CSA 31, the MTD, and then there's the county with all its various departments. You know, they all touch us in different ways and uh, different amounts, I guess planning and the justice system and public works and the sheriffs are the four biggest, I would think, um, and child and family services, but for a more specific part of the community. And then there was the part about UCSB and a lot of their services, which, you know, as we all know, are pretty much only limited to students, except for a small number that aren't. And so the outcome for this one was 
one, to just get a better understanding of what's out there, you know, have that comprehensive list, but then also to just brainstorm one or two ways to better collaborate and better enhance services by working with existing service providers to you know, meet our needs in a where they align. So I guess that is the outcome and discussion question for this is what areas of collaboration exist with other districts in the county, how can we enhance it, um, and how can we better localize those services that you, know, you read about. Jake. Some of the things that our beautification service is doing are things that are, may or may not fall into stuff that the U.S. Sanitary has done or funds um, for currently through like the park district with adopt a block and maybe there's some benefit in at least opening up a communication or communication channel with Lido West because I feel like we oftentimes just ignored them. Okay, beautification. Um, and then that's a good question. I, I if we have a uh, any maybe some more specific details uh, about uh, Google West and some of the services that they're providing in the community, because I know there's um, obviously the, the sewage itself, but there's Adopt the Block, mm -hmm. the street sweeping. Um, Which is, is happening there, this summer. I've been yes. seeing it a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is, are there any others that I'm forgetting? I think that the idea, the, one of the ideas I heard out here, and I don't know if it's Goleta West or Goleta Water, but you know, it's it's bringing um, recycled water farther out into the community, and I know that the parks are interested in that, but it just seems like, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. Now that we're out of the drought, everybody forgets that we are in a drought. <laughs> but when the drought comes back again, everybody's going to want the purple pipe again, or and I don't know what the real plan is between Kalita Water District and Kalita West about expanding the use of uh, Kalita West water. Okay. Um, and in, in that vein, I think um, I was told the other day that IVRPD is looking at um, uh, doing recycled water, hooking up to UCSB's purple pipe for the Pardalk Gardens Park. And the Just other thing up. we talked about with Goleta West Sanitary District and Goleta Water is could we ever do some cleaning at the sidewalks? Um, another kind of just general area that we can better collaborate is uh, just working more with the city of Goleta. Um, I'm excited by what we're doing right now with the library services. I think that's a really good step. Um, but other than that, the city of Goleta's main services or programs that have to do with Isla Vista are just responding to Deltopia and Halloween with <laughs> a bunch of parking restrictions each year. And I think that we can have some more regional collaboration. Um, and also on that, I think that our staff should be engaging with um, the county executive office on um, the ongoing negotiations for the long-range development plan, just because they're talking about a lot of uh, a lot of ways that UCSB's development um, should be uh, coordinated with the local jurisdictions, and um, how the CSD fits into that. Maybe not as a formal member, but just as the county should know about what services we're providing here, so that they can see how they can collaborate with us. So one, uh, sorry, uh, go ahead. I just have a question. Um, so earlier Ross said that water or supplying water is a latent service, right? Mm -hmm. How do we act upon recycling water or, um, yeah, recycling water to IV if it's a latent service? How do we, what process is that? For the, from what I was hearing, the, it sounds like the Parks and Rec are looking at maybe hooking up the purple pipe from UCSB for certain aspects. Just one street. Yeah. yeah. Well, that would be that would not be something that the district would have the ability to do. It sounds like something IVRPD is doing in conjunction with the UCSB. Um, for the district's current activated powers, you would need some type of a tie-in. So, providing recycled water from UCSB for uh, landscaping in a parking lot might be a way that that you could hook up without having it be. A, the activating of a power to specifically recycle water uh, as a wastewater management uh, type of, of a function. So that would be one way you could tap into that area through an existing activated power. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. 
So one uh, thing that I was thinking about, um, and it's not really listed on the government options study, but um, Marborg is out here as a, our trash collector, and um, we had a couple comments about the trash cans on part all that never seem to uh, uh, cease to uh, be a, a cause for concern, um, just because uh, the, they aren't they aren't well kept. So I think that's a big one is is trying to figure out what we can do to better. Um, uh, maintain them or find out what their maintenance schedule is, find out if there's any maintenance going on at all. Um, and Do they in pick up the trash? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Um, owned in, by the county. Owned by the county, but I believe that Marvor is the one that picks them up. They have some sort of agreement. Yeah, the county, yeah. finally. The, the county at some point actually went to IVRPD and was like, so we keep getting complaints about these part, these garbage cans. And yeah. they're getting, sh uh, shouldn't you be doing something about them? And IVRPD is like, they're your garbage cans. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. That's That's, uh, that is very telling. It's uh, one of the reasons we did this. And so how do they pick them up by hand and empty them? I've or never seen it. Never seen I've, it. I've never seen it happen either, which is the reason I bring it up, just because we need more information about what they're even saying they're doing. Yeah. Um, okay. That could be something we... Yeah. So on top of um, that as well, um, we've talked about how uh, the biggest problem time in IV is uh, move out weekend uh, for UCSB students um, and Marburg has this large item uh, collection program. Um, but in my mind that seems incredibly uh, underutilized um, and there could be some collaborations that we could undertake maybe to uh, help make the program more accessible. Um, so. I think it'd be great for us to uh, explore and learn more about that as well. Um, in that same vein, related to just uh, trash in the community, there's there's also the the county's um, code enforcement officer that's supposed to be uh, handling handling those issues when there are things out in the community, um, like let's just say someone dumped dumped a mattress or whatever it is, um, and it'd be I've tried to reach out to him and try to see if we can talk with him because he pops up every once in a while, the guy named Brad Spencer. Um, but we, it would, again, with this issue, it just seems like there's not really a whole lot of coordination and maybe we can be that body to help bring everyone together and get some coordination. Yes. A couple of, couple of issues. Um, one to piggyback on, on your mind. Um, it seems to me like move out, move in is just incredibly wasteful. I recognize all the efforts that the county's made over the years, Marburg and so on, to um, have it be less chaotic and leave less of a mess. But it seems like it's a gigantic opportunity to reimagine move out as a zero waste declaration. Um, and that would involve so many different agencies, um, you know, including UCSB, uh, as well as um, uh, landlord owners. And uh, anyway, so uh, I, I, I'm not going to go <coughs> spinning off on that anymore. Um, the second issue is um, I don't know whose purview this would be under, but it needs to be under somebody's purview. Over the decades, we have lost so many big trees, and it really has degraded the quality of life in Isla Vista, and I think it's not noticed because it happens at kind of a glacial pace. Uh, I know that IVRPD at times has fostered, ha has supported a, a street fruit tree uh, program where they planted trees in the parkways where sidewalks would have been, had zoning been such that we had sidewalks and parkways. Um, but most of those are gone now. Um, but we also need big shade trees. Um, so uh, I just, I think that needs to be on somebody, somebody's agenda, you know, it needs to be in somebody's purview. And we need to incentivize the planting, planting of uh, fruit trees and big shade trees. Those are excellent points, um, and I'm going to come to you, but I want to ask Ross quickly first. I know we've talked a little bit about the tree issue and how they end up getting consolidated in the parks under that program, and how, you know, when we were thinking about ideas, there was the idea that we'll, you know, 
it would be difficult for us to do a whole lot because of the gift of public funds thing. Are there creative ways that you can think of where there could be some sort of a replanting program um, for property owners? <coughs> Maybe the district can incentivize having them planted in other places, uh, connected to community facilities. For example, uh, I don't know how much of the lands around the community center are fall within the the purview. Like right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that there are surrounding landscape areas that are mm -hmm. within the district's power to, you know, incentivize planting, okay. that might be a way. Um, but it's it, it's not so the thing in the past I think was if a sidewalk goes in um, and they got to take the tree out because it's too close to the sidewalk um, the county right now just gives uh, pays IPRPD to plant another tree in the park mm -hmm. and the idea was well what if the county just paid directly the property owner so that they could put a different tree on their property and that apparently wasn't legal well there's my, 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 my conversations with the county were that they were they ran into two problems, one of which being a liability issue and one of which being a giving of public funds issue, but that they felt that there were workarounds to this. If, for example, they had a, um, instead of just planting 10 trees, if they provided 30 trees, but the 30 trees were um, anyone who wants to plant a tree in the area can come first come, first serve, right. and then pick them up from us, and then um, we will not, like, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a massive like cost savings to the property owner that wants a tree because you're getting this free tree, but the county's not choosing who's getting the yeah. tree, and the county said, but but the county just didn't want to have to coordinate that much stuff, and yeah. so my discussions okay. with them were that if we were willing to take on the burden of a coordination and planning of these kinds of events, um, that they would love to participate. But yeah. yeah, that's that. That takes care of all the issues that I would see. Yeah. My, my conversation with them last was that they're still checking with their county council if that's possible. That was like three months ago. They're like, yeah, we're still interested in that, but we're not, you know, we still need to figure out the nuts and bolts of what we're going to do. It doesn't take three months. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to figure it out. I think okay. it's kind of like the street lighting program. We first have to take notice of it, and then we you know, we got a short-term plan to make some improvements, but I think we need a, a longer-term plan. But I like what you're saying about, you know, you look out there and that tree, like that evergreen, that's right, right in my vision. You know, I remember Isla Vista with a lot more trees like that, and they have gone away the same way I, I go play golf out at Sandpiper. A lot of their trees got taken out by the drought and it was a lot of the really cool old ones like that. And I think that the beetles are getting them and stuff. So the real thing is, is we need somebody to come in here. Can you replant those trees and will they grow? And, or what are the species of trees that could, you could replant and will thrive? And I, and I just don't know that. But I remember Isla Vista being different um, when in, in the 70s and the 80s of the tree species. Okay, we're going to go over the poll. This is an issue that's really important to me, and I would have brought it up someplace. So um, I think we should have a positive plan for how to approach questions of planting trees and replacement, but preserving trees is another thing, because if you preserve a mature tree, it's in effect like planting 30 or 40 trees, because you end up starting out with these little baby trees that take 20 years to be uh, substantial, whereas there are opportunities to save trees, like deliberately having policy that if we possibly can, we will go around the tree to preserve this healthy, mature tree. And I know a uh, tree care person who's been working here in this area for 40 something years, and his his specialty is preserving trees that are in the way for one reason or another and making it work out. And uh, I'm going to have a meeting with him next week. So I was wondering if the CSD might have consider consulting with somebody like this person, a tree specialist, whenever, or maybe ongoingly, but whenever you certainly have you know, this confrontation between the needs 
of a tree and as if it were separate from us. And they're not. Um, to have a healthy, thriving community, you have to consider trees as part of that community. So that's what I would really love to see happen. So maybe here's an idea. Would you be interested in having him come and talk to you about trees? Yeah, I think we'd we'd, we'd love we'd love to meet him and find out more information. That sounds very very cool. And and I guess I thank you for bringing it to our attention. I I would say um, just in general um, when when we've been talking um, with the county public works department about this issue and their plans to construct more sidewalks, I think our board seems to have been pretty clear that um, we in no way want them to prioritize uh, building new sidewalks, which I think is where the bulk of these uh, replacement uh, trees end up uh, coming into play if there's a tree that's too close to the right-of-way that they buy. Um, and we continue to be very clear that we would like uh, to see that, uh, that those public works dollars prioritized towards street lighting in dark areas rather than in some of those uh, sidewalk areas. So, um, But we, we'd love to be in touch with you. I think in the long run, we should think about maybe just collectively by a board we have to think about if we want to do that is to fund a, a tree study in isla vista but maybe somebody's already done it i don't i don't know um but you know I, just on another note i know when we put in the big king pongs down on part all that created a pretty big community uprising <laughs> that not a lot of people like those big king palms and there was a real discussion in the community of we're we, we put the wrong kind of trees in here so trees can be controversial too about <laughs> varieties um, very good point to, but if I can uh, Spencer trees are of they do create a lot of controversy and they also create a lot of potential liability issues because the number one uh, I would say risk management uh, issue that we deal with are slip and falls on sidewalks and those rises are created primarily by parkway or private property adjacent uh, uh, growth mm -hmm. that they raise up the would, panels. Would you say that we would take on significant uh, uh, risk if, if we were to do some sort of coordination program like Jay had described? No, I don't, I don't think it, it's a concern in terms of a coordination program and the planting and all that. I think it goes more to the public comment about preserving trees in place. Yes. You, know, you, you, you have a number of issues that overlap. You have, you have the preservation of existing natural resources in your district um, with you know, the climate aspects that, 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 that it, is, it entails with that. It, but you also have a, an activated power of maintaining lights and sidewalks. Well, some of those trees are going to get away in the light. So do you yeah. approach the problem from the eliminating the obstruction, i.e. the tree? Can it support the type of you know, mechanical intervention, cutting off limbs that might be, that might be one way to go? Or is it a matter of engineering the light in such a way that it provides light without interfering with the existing tree? Um, if that tree is pushing up sidewalk panels, you know, the, the cost associated with maintaining that sidewalk is going to be greater there than it is for a situation where you're planting a new tree in a current or existing you know, parkway uh, and the type of tree that you pick. You know, there's ones with a small, uh, there's an arborist term for it that I don't remember off the top of my head, but basically it's like a root ball. It doesn't go too far out, it doesn't spread, and it doesn't push stuff up. Uh, you know, when a lot of communities were being planned and built 50 years ago, they weren't mm -hmm. taking into consideration those things. And the other aspect of it is because it ends up being a, a, an inverse condemnation question is that if the tree falls over, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, usually it's the public entity's fault for it intrudes into your water line, for it intrudes into your sewer line, you have an inverse condemnation problem. So. Well, those are great points, and it'll be something that is right. important to consider. Um, I understand that very well. And my thought is that we need to look at it kind of like we were earlier talking about the coordination of the body. That is that when you do something, throw something like that, you do it inviting those different interests to come together and discuss how we might solve it, rather than seeing it only as a liability issue, which seems to always get, you know, kind of take on the power. You know. um, 
but there are, in fact, what I'm dealing with myself is exactly that kind of issue where there are, you could say, people on <coughs> both sides of an issue in terms of a tree and how to resolve that other than just simply the simplest, cheapest way, which is cutting off the tree and replacing it with little baby trees. So new ways are being discovered. It's not, we don't necessarily have to always do things the same way. So I, I really hope we can have a sort of progressive approach to this. Well, those are great points, thank you. And your, your point about uh, the value of mature trees in our community is very well taken. Ethan? Um, so we only have an hour and a half okay. left. We should probably move on. Um, do you know which, because uh, I don't think we're going to be able to get to everything, which parts do we want to do in the, the time that we have remaining? So um, we can skip, we can skip the, um, let's see, I'm missing my number. Uh, we can skip the 3.8. Seven, six, and eight, and five. We can go very five and four. We can go extremely fast, and then I think it's important we get to ten through fourteen. Okay. Um, okay. Sounds great. Um, I'm gonna go over to you. Yes. Trees or overpopulation? Which is it? There's too many people on the earth. There's only eight people in all of art because the world won't be spread. <laughs> thank, thank you for your wisdom as always. Okay. <laughs> okay um, so in that case, um, if there's nothing else on this one, I think we'll go on to item 3.4. Yeah, just okay. really quickly, you know, we've talked about ACA1. Ross already covered a little bit that it reduces the 55%. Uh, it reduces the threshold to pass taxes for or pass bonds to 55%. Um, there's the RDA 2.0 efforts that the state legislature is looking at that are more affordable housing focused, but I couldn't find enough information to, there's just not a lot out there that's public that's been developed yet, even CSDA doesn't have. Um, and then there's the Enhanced Infrastructure Finance District, which is, from my understanding, not something we can do ourselves, but we'd have to work with the county to <coughs> ensure happens, but it is another way to be funding mm -hmm. transit libraries, you know, you know it, public mm -hmm. facilities. Mm -hmm. Rossi, do you have anything to add in terms of this section? No, th that covers it. Uh, with the exception of, I did stumble across a, uh, a bill that might be of interest in conjunction with IVRPD, uh, AB 209, uh, Assemblymember Limon is looking at establishing a program for outdoor equity grants, and the purpose of it would be to provide outreach uh, to connect outdoor activities to uh, serve students who are eligible for free or reduced price uh, meals, uh, foster kids, and uh, those who are, are not English proficient. Uh, that might impact some of the, the residents of this district and might provide a means for getting grant funding uh, to program in conjunction with IVRPD and their, and their parks. Yeah, we did get that grant, as you all are aware, to fund the outdoor activities that are run out of here, and we weren't able to fund that. Uh, but that sounds like that's a cool. Yeah, just just be more money along those lines. Okay, and then right. moving next to resident priorities. So everyone got the opportunity matrix and the last budget uh, input we got. Mm -hmm. That was just to give you more information. No necessarily discussion needs to happen now, unless there's anything uh, anyone wants to really highlight as interesting or that we should keep at the top of our heads uh, in terms of what was presented in the opportunity matrix in the last budget forum. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the only outcome for that. Is there anything that are really anyone feels really strongly about that we bring up? We'll go if you do we can also go to the goals and then yeah. bring them up there too. Yeah I'll wait until three until mm eleven. -hmm. And then last um, in terms of director Assessment of the district, everyone, for the most part, has filled it out. We got five responses. Was there anything, um, again, let's just expedite this more than what we had originally planned, but is there okay. anything that you filled out that you want to really emphasize for the whole group? Um, I could, I'm going to share the responses with everybody 
later, but is there anything you said in your responses that you thought you know, really you wanted to emphasize? Okay. Um, I, I, I think it's worth really pointing out is that it, it, when, I, when I really noticed it, it was almost uh, um, it was exciting. Uh, it, it's one of the, the strengths that our district has is the way that we're funded with utility users tax. It means that a lot of districts have to wait for property tax reassessments or they've got issues with dark reporting on um, uh, like the you, you population increase, but you actually find out that you actually, whereas because we have a utility users tax, if there are more people here, they will use more utilities whether we figure out that they're here or not. Well, if they're, if, whether the property get reevaluated or not, our utility users tax actually scales with the stuff going on here. And so we're really set up in a way that almost no other special district ever is set up in order to be able to continue to scale our stuff with the people that are here. So I, 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 when I, when I, like, I really noticed that fact. I got so excited. And I just want to like emphasize that strength of our district. Um, okay. um, one thing just jumping off that, that Jonathan and I have chatted out uh, about a little bit is um, with the UT and the uh, different fluctuation and volatility that that provides, it will be important for us just to all be uh, good at monitoring what the other utilities in the area are doing in terms of rates. Uh, we had some changes at the Goleta Water District. Um, it's going to turn out to be fine for our revenue estimates, but it will be good for us to keep tabs on that. Ethan? Thank you. Uh, one thing that I was going to talk about kind of as a opportunity and a threat. Uh, first on the opportunity side, I'm really excited to see um, as we develop our staff what new capabilities we have. Um, like It's a really exciting time having the community center director coming on and the assistant general manager, our awesome legal team keeping up the great work. Um, I'm excited to see what kind of um, additional things we're able to do and I really have a lot of faith in the staff we've assembled. Um, same with on our board, I'm really grateful that we have a really active board and I think we're doing a great job. Um, where I see a threat, or it's more just something we have to monitor, is really like succession planning and uh, having a um, pipeline of people to serve in capacities in the district, whether it's on the staff, whether it's on the board, or whether it's on um, an advisory committee like our uh, awesome community center committee that we are actively appointing people to. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, technical knowledge that goes into this, as uh, Ross has shown us today, and we, we know every meeting. Um, so it's just important for us to keep that engagement level high, um, especially since, I mean, we, we've spoken a lot about people who uh, weren't here in 2014, and uh, now we've had a full rotation of UCSB classes um, where there was no one here in 2014. Um, but when we think about the foundation of this district and the founding of this district, 2016, 2017, um, in a few years there's going to be no one uh, at the school who was here at our time of formation. So um, just keeping the public engagement high and making sure that we have opportunities for people to get involved. Well, those are both really good points. And uh, I would uh, throw out an idea that I saw uh, the city of Goleta is doing where they have uh, sort of a public um, public engagement uh, program where uh, people get to go and participate and learn just about public service in different ways um, that they can become involved uh, through the city. And um, so that's something that um, I think it'd be really cool for us to look into and uh, you know see how well that was performing from the photos I saw. They got really good attendance. So um, I appreciate you for bringing that up. One comment I wanted to make. Um, I think that um, we have a lot of strengths going for us. Uh, the two biggest ones I put is just our nimbleness and our cooperativeness. I think that I've been just really impressed to see how um, we have been able to approach things in such a cooperative manner when it comes to, like one example I put down was our the direction we're going with the graffiti abatement ordinance where we're trying to get an agreement, uh, agreements with property owners uh, before, you know, sort of provide that carrot rather than stick when it comes to getting graffiti taken care of. Um, so that's just one example. But I think um, when it comes to an area for improvement that I think is our most important area that we need to improve in, it's in communications. It's in um, ensuring that uh, information is, is flowing, um, information is accessible uh, through the website, um, through social media, uh, through other print materials, um, and 
especially um, when it comes to uh, highlighting the work that um, our staff and our board is doing, it's super important, I think, to, um, to, to take advantage of the opportunities to throw out press releases and to um, you know, send, just blast this stuff out into the community, um, make sure that the awareness level is high. Um, it's an area where, um, you know, it, I think it's, it's natural for organizations for communications to come last since we got to do the things before we can talk about doing the things. Uh, but now that we have um, our assistant general manager uh, coming on board, I see it as a huge opportunity for that to be a yeah. big priority. It's going to be one of her big charges. Um, to add on to the communication part, I noticed that the website isn't complete. There's a lot of things that are missing, like the resources. I don't think there are links um, in where the resources are or even email addresses that aren't complete within the, the staff. And I don't know. Do we, have, do we still have interns? Or? We don't have interns right now. Okay. Okay. But the website's not going to be an intern thing from now on. Okay. It, now that we have Deborah okay. and myself being relieved by Deborah taking on some responsibilities, that could be a big priority. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, sort of hand in hand uh, with, because uh, I, I say it's communications, but also just this flow of information in general. And I think that um, one area where it'll be cool to uh, have Deborah on board is in having someone uh, to be able to clerk the board, basically. And uh, well, I use clerk uh, in, a, in a, you know, a loose way, since technically you're the clerk. but. Um, someone who can uh, take those uh, de more detailed minutes maybe than we've been doing in the past. Um, someone that can handle all the different documents and stuff and make sure that uh, they're all linked and uh, board members know how to get to them and board members have them ahead of time before the meeting so that people can try to uh, make sure that we've gone through a thorough review beforehand. Um, I think that that will be good in terms of us being able to function well and not getting caught up in uh, minutia just so that uh, we're all on the same page about what the facts are and getting those things ahead of time uh, will be I think really beneficial to that. Ethan? Thank you. Another uh, thing that I had as a threat is uh, scope creep. Uh, just kind of the, the threat of being taken off our, our target which we were in an exciting time. There's lots of things that have to get done in this community um, but I think that threat is uh, when we have so many things in front of us we can lose sight of the things that we're really making progress on. Um, so kind of finding a balance of being adaptive and meeting the immediate needs while also having a long-term plan. Uh, that's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. I think that's a really good point. Jay? So one, th one thing I listed, but, but I, I, I agree with that. Um, well, one of the things that I listed is um, as a general weakness of our district, um, which is in some sense also a strength though. I, I, I think I'm on the, on the balance that I, I consider this to be a weakness is, is that <coughs> our staff, our board, we have comparatively little experience in special districts. Um, this is something that I mean, a lot of us, we kind of came in here and kind of, okay, let's figure out how to put this all together. And I think it's a strength in the sense that it allows us to sometimes think outside the box in ways that other things don't have. But in some cases, it's like, took us a lot longer than maybe a, a Los Olivos, for example, just kind of like threw together a district in the course of a very short period of time. Um, and some of the stuff that we were kind of taking a long time to figure out what basic paperwork things. Um, the, um, <coughs> the extension of that, I think, then, is that I, when we kind of, the district got patterned, and I think this is, I think this is very unfortunate, it kind of got patterned after a city. It, it feels a lot more, the way that we do all of our organization um, feels a little bit more like even the county than most of the special districts that I end up experiencing. And what that means is, is that we end up, in, as far as like our, our problems with, with our work, you know, not sure the problems, but the things we were just listing, as we'd love to have more public communication and better channels of the public and everything. Um, I go to a lot of other special districts, and the people who are at the audience, we have so many tables, why are they way over there? Like, I go to the Lompoc Cemetery District meeting, and I just sit at the table with everybody. I go to some of the CSD meetings, so I just sit at the table with everyone as a member of the public. We had discussions, and members of the public are able to just participate in the conversation. We don't have a lot of this extremely formal to the point of like, I mean, it's particularly some of the people on Goleta are really, really picky about this, where we carefully set up turn orients on everything that we're doing and then try to time limit everything, even among the board members, because we might get too many bites at the apple, as one of the Goleta board members like to say. But the mm -hmm. special districts, I mean, I, I mean, Guadalupe Cemetery, I just, I just love it when there's two board members who just start, start going back and forth really fast 
trying to like understand what, what's going on, and and it, and it, and they, I feel like they get stuff done quicker. And then, as again, as a member of the public, I'm at the table with them, and I'm able to actually participate in that conversation. And I, I think that it it makes it feel a lot more interactive and a lot less like there's this elite group at the table, and then there's the audience out there. And and I think that in order to really help also enable some of these things, I think. And the, the, the noticing thing, I actually felt really deeply when, when the comic got up because I mean, I, I had always complained the county with, with the amount of time that they would, they would give before noticing things, the county was, was kind of tight. But I knew internally they had lots of visibility on it. And I was talking to, to Esther, and Esther would tell me, yeah, three weeks from now, something's going to come up in the identity if you're paying attention to this. But I never fathomed me that I'd be on a district and three days before the meeting, I get the agenda and I'm realizing I've got to try to scramble in order to get comments from people in the public. I'm sometimes uh, you know, still the day of the meeting, like trying to coordinate, maybe can, can you maybe come to the meeting? I like, know this is something you care really strongly about and everything. And like having a long-term meeting planning agenda that we're collaboratively able to work on so that we can coordinate the fact that a month from now something will come up on our agenda so that we can make certain the right members of the public are able to be there so that we can have a conversation with the members of the public as opposed to simply having them in the audience watching us bicker for a while and then providing a little short blurb of comment like i just think there's just so much opportunity for us to be better at interacting with the public and that i see other districts being already better at interacting in those exact same manners that i would love to see us really try to fix Okay. Quick Russ, comment, yeah. I, could, I, I think it kind of goes to a couple of comments, which is or the thread between a couple of comments, which is why I, think I wanted to say something. Is one of the things I've, I've been working with Jonathan on is kind of routinizing a, a, a staff process and a schedule, so you don't have a lot of rushing around at the last minute. You don't have notice going out just under the wire for the you know, required minimum amount of time, and so you know. For a while, we had a standing meeting of Wednesdays at two. We were going to talk for an hour and a half. It's just that you know, Jonathan's job for a long time has required two and a half Jonathans, and you know now that there's a, a, a an assistant a GM, I, I think we're going to be able to revisit some of that uh, higher level planning to provide that type of you know of foresight and to provide that the type of structuring. To, to really maximize the, the time at the board meeting when the public is, is, is present. And so that things like a, a typo here d doesn't creep in and cause you know, last minute heartburn for, uh, for folks. So we have certainly gone down that road before and I think that with the path that the board is taking with hiring uh, an assistant GM, that's really gonna help. And I think it's gonna hit that thread that has been mentioned by a, a couple different people. So we're gonna keep working on that. Uh, on our side of things, and we'll we'll keep you in the loop as it gets developed. Great, I, th I think that's a great um, a great thing, and I'm I'm excited about that. Um, just because it, I think it can um, be, uh, you know, n no one is uh, happy when we got to do the revisions at the last minute. Um, but also, um, we and and this isn't always. I would actually say this is uh, almost always not our fault. But when we say we're trying to work out an agreement with another agency and they tell us they're gonna have it at a certain point in time and then they don't. And um, I, I do feel a little bad about that when we have to put that on the agenda because then we end up just having it on the agenda over and over and over again because we're just waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, but um, I, you know, it, that's one of those things where, I don't know, if there are creative things we could do to improve on that, you know, that could be, I think. One, could, one of them really just comes down to having the bodies. Yeah. Like I said, a lot of times, Jonathan, we need two and a half Jonathans to, to, to do the work of the district, you know, and I need to be cognizant of making sure I'm not doing administrative stuff because there's no reason to charge you legal fees for administrative things. And I think having an extra person is going to go a long way to standardizing a lot of that process and, and having it be, uh, you know, the transparency and the insight, I think is how Jay said it, uh, to make sure that we're not having things being jammed up in the just improving the overall perception and also the, the ability of the, of the board and the staff to communicate with the public. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go to the public and then I'm gonna go to Ethan. Uh, I would really like to uh, thank everyone on the board um, for your, your receptivity to public comments during this workshop um, in, or retreat. And uh, I, I'd really like to uh, honor 
uh, Director Freeman's orientation towards listening uh, and outreach, uh, and you sent him a just voice. And I would very, very much like to add uh, postering in a few select locations, consistent postering in a few locations too, to notify community members who may not be regular social media users. Um, you know, maybe like a food co-op, maybe like something on Pardal, you know, maybe the AS Pardal Center, um, as well as the window at the, at the office. So thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. Thank you for those comments. Uh, I think uh, the postering idea is a great idea. I know. I think IVRPD goes and throws their agenda out on a bunch of bulletin boards. So maybe that's something we start doing too. Yeah, that's a good one. Ethan. Thanks. Um, I was going to say one strength that I really want to emphasize is the deep partnerships and relationships that we've made, especially with a few organizations like uh, the Isle of the City Youth Projects. I never would have known when we signed our first service agreement. Um, how much partnership we would do with them. Same with UCPD. Um, those two organizations in particular, we have a really strong bond with. Um, I would say the Foot Patrol, we have a really good relationship with right now, um, and that's especially reflective of um, Lieutenant Camarena's leadership. He's really made an effort to work closely with us. Um, but I think in these coming months, we should really identify some other organizations that we want to develop those ties with as well, because they really pay off. It's a great point. Um, is there anything else that people want to specifically mention for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities? Okay, with that, then I'll kick it back to you, Jonathan. I think you had a, okay. some general themes. Yeah, so I have, yeah, and I have all your responses in there, so I can work off of that. Uh, so last, so this is the last of like the previous section, or the, the, we're ending the first part of the retreat, the second part, we're gonna push over to other times, policy manual, if you have ideas, always message me and we'll have them at the policy committee, that board management relationship. I think we can just wait till Deborah gets here, we'll just do it then. Um, and then we'll move on to part three, which is the future of the district and our goals and our values and our vision and mission. Uh, so quickly, we'll, we'll, we're doing them in order. Uh, it's going to be values, then one year goals, three year goals, mission, and then vision. But then I thought last minute, OK, maybe we should just do the mission before the goals. And so I'm proposing we do values, then mission, and then we'll go into the goals. But for values, what uh, the, we have put as the outcome is for the directors to you know, each give one or two values that not, doesn't have to be too fleshed out, but what you're thinking the values of the district should be. And then you know, for all of these, I'm going to do my homework and make them all nice and put them together and bring them back to the next board meeting. But some notes for the values are, what do we consider important? What do we believe in? And they're going to guide our actions and culture at the end of the day. So and I guess maybe it would be good to just go around and have everyone give a value or two. I'll write them down, and then we'll keep them forward next time. I think that sounds great. Um, anyone want to volunteer and throw out ones first? Ethan? Okay, so I can start maybe we did down the line. Um, my big one is uh, that this district is committed to ensuring that everyone feels safe in Isla Vista and that our efforts are always uh, working towards that. Okay. I'll second that. <laughs> I, think, I think we'll probably all end up seconding that one. Uh, <laughs> the <laughs> most time fun spot. one thing. Uh, yeah. Very uh, time spot. Yeah, I like that. Um, Bob? I, I think the district already has introduced the value of maybe we want to put it in writing, but, you know, public input. I, I just find that mm -hmm. you, you guys you guys are really strong on turning to the public and saying, hey, Bob, can you take public comment? <laughs> I mean, and, and so it's the, you guys have that value. You're really looking for it. And I think it came out of the AB3 process. So. I think that's something that's important for our district and the community as a whole is just the idea of social justice. And I think that um, in uh, programs that we have underway, uh, I always think of the beautification program, really, which embodies that in so many ways to me. Um, it's just important that that is, that is in writing. Christine, Jay, you have any? I think it's putting people first, and um, the fact that we all don't have the same perspective on things um, is what makes us really strong. Um, being able to have opposing ideas, but at the end find a way to solve things and find alternatives is I think something that this district does really well. That's good. So 
It's certainly not what I, what I would have led with, because I would have led with the transparency one. So glad that that was brought up, Tom. And um, the uh, uh, transparency. Yeah, I would I would have led with the transparency. I mean, the, that's a public input one. I mean, that's what I've led. I'm, I'm just, I'll just put what I'm about to say. I'm just saying, like, I, I would not have led with this one. I would have led with the um, public uh, the public input one that, that Bob's brought up here. Um, but I think that we should. So, I mean. It, in some sense, we are a steward of the of the, the tax money that is being funneled through us from the people, and we should figure out how to use that tax money in, in innovative and efficient ways. And uh, I think that we've got a great ability to do that because we've got an eclectic power set, and we've got um, a youthful and um, like vital board in the sense in comparison to a lot of special districts that have. Um, a, people who are barely paying attention sometimes and are just doing what everyone does. I mean, I, I say youthful and vital because I actually consider Bob to be very vital. <laughs> so, um, it's Getting old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but sometimes, sometimes you're actually a little bit more fierce than I am on, a, on the occasional yeah. day. So um, it's something that uh, I, I think that, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I'd like to make that a value of our district that we're trying to figure out how to do things in innovative and efficient manner. I, I think in the long term, Jay, that becomes very, very important about us spending this money wisely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's like always revisiting what we currently do. You did it with the, you know, the, the um, safety station program of challenging, is that cost effective? But I think that came to say, well, how do you measure the cost effectiveness? And there's bigger ways to. Well, that to why is the part? part. So we'll, we'll, I mean, I'm going to bring that one back up. No, no, no. But <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think that's that's something you've got to always ask that question: Is it effective? Because someday we're going to have to leave a program we started and say that's not cost effective. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be hard to do. But mm -hmm. government doesn't do a very good job of that. <laughs> okay. Um, one idea that I have, something I've been thinking about, is um, for a long time, Isla Vista has been an underserved community and just kind of, I don't know how to phrase this, but the spirit of not settling for um, something that's not what this community deserves. Mm -hmm. So I guess not thinking small, um, being ambitious, and not settling for, for less. Mm -hmm. I think the last thing um, that I would close out with, um, and I'm trying to figure out if there's a word for this, um, but um, when we are sort of this uh, very uh, youthful com community with so much turnover, uh, I think that it's important for us um, as policymakers and representatives to always be remembering um, the fact that um, it's not our constituents' uh, job to be able to figure out how to get something done. That's our job. And uh, we, I think, and I think we do a really good job of this, is uh, trying to meet people where they are uh, and, and trying to help educate them on, on how things work and helping them figure something out within all this web of different government agencies that do things in IV. Um, so I don't, I don't know if there's a word for that, but um, maybe, maybe it really just boils down to education. It's not quite con constituent service, but it's like similar. <laughs> I, I, I think it is constituent service or con and, and education, yeah. I think yeah. is good. Oh, yeah, that's it. That, no, I, know. I can figure out how to write that. Okay. We're good on values? Okay, this is good. And are you going to put this in a value statement or just a yeah, list? Yeah, so what you'll get at the end of this as a board item is like a two Doc, two page document that has you know, IBCSD, mission, vision, values, goals, one year goals, three year goals. And then, so how about a comprehensive document that has all our goals, values, mission, and vision on it? Awesome. And then okay. objectives. And I just have, you know, thinking when, you know, people, people have been coming here for a long time and getting a great education. And I get back to saying, well, how do you look back on your time at UCSB? And I think what Ethan brought up, number one, is that they went to a community that they really had fun at. Not only feel safe, but it was a fun environment to be to get an education in. I, I think that should be 
you know, it's a little bit more we, we're trying to we're trying to give that value to people and it's the best four or five years of your life. Um, at least I can attest to that, you know, back when I went to college. And so, you know, and, and I, I still have a great time to work my, what, what happened to me in college and it was, it was a great experience. And I think that's what we want people to remember us for is that this is a safe community and a great place to get an education and learn about the community or whatever. I don't know how I would get there, but. Sounds like something Natalie would have said. <laughs> <laughs> I remember she used to say that. So. She hasn't even come back yet. You know, She's where in is San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Very we're cool. good. So mission, everyone has their mission statements. So I made two drafts based on you know what I've heard from everybody, just the general tone. We're not gonna write by committee because that's, you know, everyone knows it's the worst thing in the world to do, but. <laughs> Uh, based on what you've read, is there anything um, that you like or don't like or want to emphasize more or to emphasize less? Uh, based on like, you know, what, what, what draws you in? Or did I completely botch you and should we look at other types of mission statements? I tried to keep it two sentences just to make it read, readable and remember. Is this one that we, that we did last year? No, we did the vision, which is always on the agenda, for Isla Vista, by Isla Vista, yeah. building the community we deserve. I'll, I'll go ahead and go to you. Do, do you have a comment? I think I understand what you're saying. I, I just will say I, I know that um, uh, as someone who was a student and then now continues to live in Isla Vista after that and consider it very much my home, I think um, where we where really, really, really come in in my perspective is really by promoting the idea that um, this place is your home and that um, you know it's a place where you can stay after you graduate. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm just so what you say. Absolutely. It's I didn't mean to just totally focus on the students. No. I, I was just focusing on the, you know, the overreaching majority that affect this community. Right. But I realized that the people that live there are very important. And, and that, uh, I'll, I'll go over to you. Were you, were you done? Oh, yeah. No, I, I, th I think I was, no, I appreciate your comment. I think it, it is really important for us to uh, be uh, both cognizant but also uh, very forthright that we are representing everyone in the community, uh, families, children, um, students that aren't college students, um, yeah, all of those things. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I really like what we have in the draft mission statement, um, but I do think that this draft mission statement is an excellent one specific to our board of directors, but maybe not um, the best mission statement for like the district at large, because I, I think it should be for the district at large more service oriented and having like a sentence in there about good community engagement and decisions that are made to uh, take into account the, the needs of residents. Um, like having one part of it be focused on the decision making aspect and the community engagement aspect, but I think that the broader vision should mostly be on the, the service. I agree with that and I also think that um, uh, when, when there is the portion about um, 
public engagement representation, giving Isla Vista a voice, that that is um, the, the latter half of the statement rather than the former half. Um, I like these, this uh, about high quality of life. Um, I know we talked a little bit about safety earlier too. It'd be great to have um, safety in there. Um, yeah, high quality of life, livability, um, it's very important. Is that livability or affordability? Uh, livability. Maybe someday we'll get to affordability. <laughs> um, anyone, anyone have any other comments on the mission statement? I think it'll be good, yeah. Um, yeah, take those comments into consideration and we can yeah. work on some, bringing yeah. something back to and, the board. And Reed also send me stuff. I don't think we have to like have it on the list. Cool. So Perfect, okay. This is a great start. And I was like, finally, we need to do this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> finally, done it. All right. So next up is the most fun part, I think, which are the goals for one for this one year. So I'm gonna just really quickly read the goals that we got from everybody, just so that we're all on the same page on that, and then we can have a conversation about, you know, we can start listing the goals that we all have an idea for, and then maybe everyone can just vote to prioritize. It doesn't mean we're going to cut or omit or you know, add anything, but just to get a sense like, wow, everyone really feels strongly about this one. We'll focus on this one. If only one person had a goal, it might fall lower to the, to the list. So. Um, so the goals that we got were expansion of our visibility in the community, uh, translation services of public meetings. I think that goes in with you know, our public engagement. Library branch, NIV. Uh, reduce the rate of crime and other public safety issues, provide an inviting and engaging experience in the community center, uh, create a municipal advisory council, and improve our community outreach. Those, and then there's one three-year goal for uh, merge, dissolve and merge CSA 31, activate trash power. So in terms of our app, based on everything we've talked about, and, and you also I know like the SMART goals, so they be specific, measurable, attainable, uh, forget the last two. Timely? I don't know what the R is. Relevant. Relevant, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's really important. <laughs> yeah. You can't have a goal like rent control again. <laughs> no, we cannot do that. <laughs> uh, so, as any, so let's just maybe do the same thing. Oh. I just, I, well, I listened to all those goals and then I, it, I mean, that we already have. But then I keep going back to these activated powers not in use and say, well, we got a Mac on there. Mm -hmm. And then we hear, do we really want to do a MAC? But then we say, can an area planning commission be effective? I keep hearing from third district, no. Um, I, do I look at a parking district and everybody tells me, that's way over your head, don't go tackle that, you'll never solve it. And then I look at code enforcement and most people say, don't touch that thing with a 10 foot pole because you'll never get out. Um, so I, I don't know, we, we really spent a long time in the AB3 formula saying these are four things that need to be tackled in the community and then are we scared of them? And, and I don't know, we're, I, you know, we're still in startup and I like that list. You just said a whole bunch of things on there that if we're successful doing that next year, I'm, I'm happy. But it always just bothers me back out here when somebody says, why aren't you doing this? <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we have had this separation right between what was in AB3 and what the board would eventually think is a good idea. Because AB3 wasn't necessarily being able to make mandates about what anything was happening. It was I mean, sometimes stuff would get thrown in there because we just wanted to make certain that we had the option of doing that if we if we decided that it would be, be powerful. Uh, and some of the things in there, I mean, like I, particularly I look at Area Planning Commission, and that's that's one where I think that I'm really glad that we got that power thrown in there. But I don't know if we're gonna. I mean, I I, I see the arguments that, that being ineffective. Yeah, because I, I neither of those from, guarantees that the master plan is ever going to get adopted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean the 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 experience. Um, I, uh, the people from we have to get the county to approve that one. And I mean, we had the people who were in the um, planning department of the county come to every three meetings. I mean, I, I, this is me editorializing heavily, but I kind of feel like they were laughing at us, the idea that they were ever going to authorize us getting that particular one, because Montecito, of course, was able to get it because they've got so much money and power and all sorts of things. And the, um, but I, 
So I, I don't find it to be that that weird that we have okay. something that was in AB3 that we might think is more of a potential long-term thing or not a priority in comparison to something that might even not have been in AB3 in the first place that we realize we can put together and are then figuring out ways of doing latent power recognition. Like, that doesn't seem horribly strange to me. I mean, there's, for what it's worth, I, I do think that the Municipal Advisory Council, even if we did the most minimum version of that, which is just the word Municipal Advisory Council, uh, which I, I, I haven't been for in the past, but I mean, it, it, I'd be more for that than not doing it. <laughs> and so, and, and that minimal version of it, I think, gives us a little bit more weight with the county on a few things um, at low cost. But I, I, I so I'm still for that. Um, I'm one of the people who argues a lot about the, the, the morass of parking when you start unraveling it and how horrible all the arguments started becoming on all sides. Um, I, uh, um, I appreciate the issues with, with code enforcement. I do think there's some, some things we can do there if we're really innovative about it. But um, it is it is one of the ones where just the default thought process for it. I, I, I understand it can be dangerous, but but I'm still glad they're all there. Like I'm glad that we, we wrote some of these extra things into those into that bill. So um, one that so I just wanted to throw a couple out there just because I had to submit this super quickly right before we started and didn't throw my goals in. Um, but I think um, and this may have been listed off. Um, obtaining uh, the buildings that were bought by the community and by the RDA, um, but well, both the buildings and the, the properties, the community center, community resource building, um, the solar parking lot, um, so that we uh, can operate and maintain them ourselves. Um, I think that's a good uh, short-ish short term goal to have, um, and now's probably the right time to act on it. The, I, I agree with those. So that's I agree a too. 1920 goal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Because um, like I have some feelings on uh the latent power or activated powers that we're not using that you discussed. Um, and I think those are more our three year goals. So I'll wait okay. a moment on those. Um, but I mean my my biggest goals for this fiscal year that we're in now and looking at the budget process we went through are having um a great opening of the community center and having really high utilization and. Um, engagement program from the point that we open the doors. Um, I think that's should be a, a very high importance on our priority list this year. Um, and then I also think just as far as um, this year with uh, our first full year of Measure R funding, I think the spirit should in general be strengthening these programs that we have in our budget. And uh, I think as we go through the fiscal year, we should look at what next service we want to kind of plan for. Um, which in our budget we do have money for a study, um, so I think that we we should think about using that um, and focusing on the planning efforts, but not focusing on implementing any new services in this fiscal year, but rather strengthening what we're doing. So I, I will push Thanks for the municipal advisory council as a potential new service, and, um, and and I'll push for it sooner rather than later. And sure. part of the reason why I'll push for it sooner rather than later is is uh, I think we, like we have to get the county to agree to it. And when you look at the people who are on the county right now, we happen to have, I think, three good votes, maybe three and a half good votes on the county for us pulling something like that off. Uh, and, and there's always the possibility that at the end of next year, maybe DOS gets replaced and we don't have the person who grew up in IV um, on, the, on the board who wants to fight for interesting things like that. And so it, like, I, I feel like if we're, we might want to try to try to get that to the county sooner rather than later. Um, so I, I think I, I generally am of the mind that in this fiscal year, um, I, I like the idea of, of looking at things that we could do with the study for a future service. Don't think that we should try to implement anything this year. Um, but the other thing that I really wanted to elevate was, um, uh, getting organized Deltopia, uh, name TBD, <laughs> um, getting that up and running and having a successful um, weekend where we uh, cut the uh, amount of people that are out on the streets and um, we cut the amount of incidents um, that we've had in comparison to years past. So to, to for sure or just leaving like raise awareness and district public outreach and engagement that include, I think that would include like the uh, translation and our better website and all that. Uh, but you know, successful community center and you know the 
fundraising that might go along with that. I think like good grand opening, the 50 year celebration, um, things like that. One thing that I didn't really mention was in terms of the census, do we want to make that a goal to be, you know, ensure that Isla Vista is counted completely? And, you know, because that is future revenue if we're counted well. Then, and it is giving the district information over who we, rep who we're, who we are serving. Do we want to make that a goal? Just be, because we've been asked to participate in this whole mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's a good idea for us to make that a goal, Ethan. Yeah, I think that we should be a resource to uh, the county's efforts in Isla Vista, but I don't think that we should take it on as a principal effort of ours just because, uh, I mean, again, going back to scope, I'm just scared uh, with everything we have to do. I don't see um, the census as something that um, we can really give much time to, given our responsibilities. Just a quick look, the county's not going to do anything, I mean, they're looking to us. But they, I, yeah, I, I yeah. think that our yeah. district is the wrong yeah. place to look. I think, um, well, with the the efforts that um, at least just have been described so far, it, it would be good to have sort of a report about what the things are that they're going to be looking to us to do and to have a discussion about that at the board level. Um, I've, I've you know, enjoyed hearing about what the calls have been like so far, but um, it would be good to hear also just in comparison what support they're just giving in general and where the support is coming from. Um, the only other little scope thing I would be nice is if we could, if we find any small um, infrastructure improvement projects, like maybe we could take on replacing the trash cans this year or do something to improve trash pickup as part of beautification or, you know, some of those things we, you, you know, I don't know what in our studies if we want to if we want to try and do something for alternative transportation just more little things that maybe could make a difference um, sometimes we did some of that with the redevelopment agency and those little things are noticed out in the community so it's just uh, you know I don't know what something would be and we did bus stops in our days but <laughs> so. no I, I like uh, I like that suggestion um, both for the bus stops and the trash cans. And um, you know, we do have the $250,000 reserve now for capital infrastructures. So if we could ever find a project to leverage against, it sure would, it's something to keep in our mind that we're looking for a, a, a re, to make a real impact with that money. <laughs> okay, cool. So do we want to prioritize these? Or? Yeah. How many people think this is an important, because we're not going to want to have like 10 goals either. We probably want to have like a focused amount that we can actually achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll try to like combine and everything and we'll make objectives and maybe incorporate, some, like, you know, an objective of this could be the translation service instead of like the goal being translation. It could be something we do. So I guess for this one, the improved public outreach, community engagement, communication, how many people think this is a should be a goal. Do we have a certain amount of votes as we go down, or just? Uh, uh, <laughs> let's just do five votes. Okay. Because yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I have to leave. You have to go. Be yeah, because okay. my last comment, but my last comment by my wife was, "Don't these guys have wives at home?" <laughs> I said only some of them. <laughs> but, but I didn't know my wife invited my family over for dinner, and no, so no. I'll, I'll stay for this part. This, part. Yeah, this is the I think the apex okay. of the sheet. Okay. Uh, who thinks this PFI vote for this one? Improve public outreach and communication. Four. Okay. Uh, the library branch uh, in Isla Vista. Wait, Do we think that I'm one could become something under services expansion or should it be its own goal or community center? I think, yeah, lump that into community center. As we start lumping things, really we're just voting against one thing at this point. <laughs> Kind of. It's not a vote. You know, okay. well, <laughs> uh, so, in terms of reducing crime, increasing safety as a goal. Fine. Got to. Uh, community center. Uh, obtaining the ownership of the RDA properties. I think that's separate than opening the community center. Yeah. Just one? 
I, I think that's important and that, that that kicks off our infrastructure, us being part of owning infrastructure. So you voting for it? I'm voting for it. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Here, here. Take, take one away, I was offered, take one away from reduced crime and public increased safety and give it to the solar level. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Uh, and then, so strengthening, I'll, I'm going to split investigating new and maybe strengthening, or do we want to make those into... You should same? probably split those. Okay, so yeah. strengthening our current programs. It's, I mean, yeah, that's like just so broad, that's though. Broad, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. we, we make it into objectives, probably like, you know, rebrand rental housing mediation program and expand its like public outreach. I, we'd have to figure out the objectives for that one. Mm -hmm. Or we could say, you know, invest into our current programs, do assessments mm -hmm. of them. Yeah. So I'll mention, when I mentioned yeah. that, I was thinking more of my philosophy of going Your through this process. Yeah, okay. like, mm -hmm. um, so maybe we can take it off. Because okay. like when we look at the safety and the public outreach, mm -hmm. Isla Vista Community Center soon, like those yeah. are all things those that was budgeted and for. And, and, those, and those have uh, uh, metrics that you could I, I would quantify. change that one to like, a, it's a goal to have continuous improvement, mm -hmm. meaning that you you always want to look at the programs you have and continuously improve them. But. Mm -hmm. And as a side note, so um, I, I think after our last conversation um, that we had with uh, UCPD and their presentations, um, I thought it was really constructive to talk to them about different metrics they can bring back to us to help us make good decisions. So I think it would be good um, maybe moving forward in our contracts to have like just some baseline like metrics um, or at least then understanding with these are some stats that we're going to come to you and want from you. Is it like, do you know how to collect it? Can you collect it? Will do you, you? want to make program evaluation a goal then? Is that what you're saying? Like create, create a, like for the board to be able to evaluate its programs. Do you want to create that as a goal for the board? I feel like, I feel like that's an inherent goal to a couple of these. That's what I, that um, was I thinking. Continuous improvement and program management is just like a continuous goal, but mm -hmm. Sometimes they should be. I think they're stable. they're bullet points under um, reducing crime and safety and uh, public outreach, community engagement. If that makes sense, yeah. They're sort of means means to the end, I guess. Yeah. So I think it's like funding slash policy priorities versus uh, how it's implemented and tracked. So and I think we're focusing on that that first part. And the, this part about investigating new services, do we want to make it a goal to investigate what new services can be brought on, or do we want to also try to merge that into some of the existing ones, like investigate new public safety? I think I heard Ethan say it, that we should put that in the three-year three. plan oh. and move that off the table because we've got enough going. I just, I just want to put my fifth vote on that map item. You can put just a one so next to it. The only person who wants to, okay. I guess. But just, I want my vote. Okay. <laughs> so, so, okay. We'll, we'll put that there. Uh, organize Deltopia. That's three. Yeah. And then small infrastructure project. I'll vote one. What is that? I had to count. I think, I, think I <laughs> voted no one. one two, I never voted. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, no, I oh, one, two, I three. I you could use one Four, five. No, I, I cast five. <laughs> <laughs> Outreach, safety, community center, nine seventy, North Hope. Yeah, that's five. Um, I mean, I, I'm the total is four plus four. Wait, 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 never mind. I do have one 15, more. Fifteen, yeah. sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. <laughs> so 19. Uh, there's nineteen votes so far, and there's five. You didn't vote for this. Yeah, Bob, do you want me to vote for uh, obtaining the? Uh, county properties or for the infrastructure. <laughs> I like them both, but have one left. I think they'll both qualify at this point if you vote. Uh, oh, that's a lot of pressure. I have two directors who aren't here and should vote yeah. offline. Um, so I'll go with uh, the small infrastructure projects. Cool. For, I'll tell you that George told me that one thing he wants me to tell everybody is that he's voting for this as a goal. Okay. And obtaining. So. Oh, that's George. Nice. <laughs> cool. Um, Technically, cool. shouldn't be to speak in front of people, but he was like, please just tell everybody that should be your goal. And all of these are just, there's no motion, and it's all there's conceptual. There's no motion. Yeah. You'll yeah. have to approve these in a future meeting. And they'll have, you know. And all votes would be cast based on all the information presented at the time of the meeting. <laughs> yeah. No decisions being made at this point. Yes. Okay. I'm actually to say that I, I'm
Thank you. You know, I, Dennis Bazanovich ran four MACs in Alameda County. Someday I'd like him to come do a presentation to us and say, could he, he told me some of them work well and some of them didn't work very well. But he was like the administrative staff for the MACs. Is that yeah, sort of we've, my we've, fault, we've, by we've the way? Been in, <laughs> we've been in communication with some one of those MACs. Theirs is a little different because no. it is appointed. I mean, I'm, there's a bunch of different ways the county could do a MAC. Um, they're fighting to get an elected MAC right now. In case you're about it, please. But you would say. Is this sort of, by the way, specifically, I will, I will, I will totally take the blame because it's totally my fault. My fault that we have not made as much progress on the MAC as we should have because I was actually assigned a task a year oh. and a half ago <laughs> to go talk with. Uh, of, of some community stakeholders in order to figure out what their needs were related to the MAC. And I oh. brought it to a meeting at the Alabama Vista Community Network and then was told that I needed to have a much more elaborate process for it in order for anyone to be willing to, to, to uh, take okay. it. Right. And, then, and then I sort of started looking into it and then I got distracted. We also took on staff and it became less clear whether I was supposed to actually, but I, but I was directly given a task and the ball was handed to me and then I just kind of, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so as the person who's like saying, I think that's one of our big priorities. <laughs> that's why we that uh -huh. have uh -huh. enough priorities. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I, w I will say though, as, as a caveat um, uh, to, to the Mac, because I've always thought it was super interesting, and I would like to pick Dennis's brain on that. Um, but one thing that is especially important to me is that as we start the cab, that the cab is very well engaged because um, you know it's it's one thing. Uh, it, it's always great to have uh, people's voices in Isla Vista elevated, but I love the idea of people in IV working to build and form this new thing and start it up. Really, the cab is going to be like doing kind of what we did, but they'll be much better supported. I think they'll have staff and all kinds of uh, be able to implement all kinds of crazy, great new ideas. So um, I would say, um, you know, that those two really go hand in hand and. Uh, we can get people, if we're going to use people's time and energy, that's where I want it, is in the cab. I think the cab looks really similar to some of the Mac drafts we came up with last year, minus a few factors. So it is a test drive. That's a great point. i got to bail on you guys. So very good job, very good organization, and thanks for coming up. Doing you guys got to drive back tonight? I do. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good luck. Thanks, Bob. All right, see you, right, see you Bob. See John, okay. real quick, going back to just your mention of the census, because I, I do want to acknowledge its importance. Um, does the county have UCSB at the table? Um, not as much, but it's because UCSB can count really easily yeah. just because who they have mm -hmm. paying res I mean, I think efforts in IB, even UCSB would have more resources to, to try to do that, I, maybe through the economic forecast. Yeah, or, that's a good point. And maybe we can make it like a small thing under public. We just let the public know it's happening, but we're not sure. like running program yeah. and UCSB is helping fund something like because UCSB I'm sure gets grants based on the yeah. census being well counted and all that. But yeah, that's, that's good. But UCSB hasn't been actively participating in the census committees that like I'm on. Do you know if they've been invited yet? Like, you know, there's a huge list that gets so we'll work to get them I'll, there. I'll, I'll chat, yeah, okay. like, I can make sure someone gets there, but cool. yeah. Right, right now, the main youth from IV are us and the youth projects and Team Center. Three of us are the main ones there. Uh, OK, next up is 1922, a little bit of a long term. So what do we want to get done in three years? It's a little bit of a different you know, thought process. I don't think we've thought about three years before. Mm -hmm. So let's maybe go around again and yes. say our priorities for the next Sure, years. I'll start over here with you. Uh, I had listed down dissolve and merge CSA 31, okay. which I'm now wondering might actually require, and for two reasons, the one brought, Ross brought up and another one that I, was, uh, that I noticed, uh, we might require as minor state law corrections, um, and uh, activate trash contracting power. Okay. Yes, Chris. Um, strengthen the beautification program and also I think the obtaining the solar lot and, um, and the 19 to 20 goals can also transition to that because it seems like a hard, a more complex thing to do. Sorry, let me yeah, that one does fit in an interesting milieu of... Uh, so you mean, we're, like, let's say hopefully we acquire them this year, but it'll take three years to like bring yeah. it up online mm -hmm. and being functioning? 
No, but activate solar light. And activate not as in like turn on the power. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like a planet can activate. <laughs> nice. Um, well, I'm going to second um, Jay's uh, CSA 31, uh, Dissolve and Merge, um, and of course inherent to that is a state law change. Um, I think that the trash thing could be uh, interesting in terms of uh, us uh, using uh, sort of uh, study money in order to look at uh, options for that. Um, so um, I guess that's kind of a second to that. Um, and I had another one written down. Come back to me. We'll go over to Ethan. Cool. I have uh, two main ones. Um, the first is to uh, exercise your powers as a parking district. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been thinking about this lately. I know, Spencer, you're bringing an item to us soon about um, how we can be better partners with the business community mm -hmm. and um, boost uh, commerce in the Pardal area. And I think that that's kind of a low-hanging fruit for what we could do with a parking district. Like When we look at this huge problem of IV parking, if we focus on that loop and the blocks immediately adjacent to it and have that business focus or or find a different goal that's very focused, I think we could make a nice entrance into that service. And then um, my second one is like when we're looking at three years, having a pretty robust housing program. And what I mean by that is um, continuing to make progress on our uh, rental housing mediation program, but then also having um, code enforcement. So those kind of working together uh, to really have a solid resource for Isla Vista renters. Okay. Good. Anything else? Three years out? What was the other point I had written down? I want to say anything about you know 2022 is when our current directors would technically all have expired terms. Mm -hmm. Or. Mm -hmm. I think we've talked enough already about just the general idea of leadership development and how important that is. Um, and that to me feels like more of a uh, less, less a tangible goal and more of a, a practice that we, that we need to be thinking about. I think we can make that tangible. There's a lot, I think the cab, like supporting the cab is a great way to make that tangible, mm -hmm. make the internship better. Um, the leadership Mm -hmm. So the last one uh, that I was going to bring up was um, planning and uh, reopening that, re-examining that. Um, I know that's something where it'll be really important to, um, you know, be in coordination with the third district office. Um, I know in the past there's been interest from their office on uh, what we could possibly do with the master plan and tweaking things, um, maybe starting over who knows um, I just think that it is it, it will be good for our district to in one way or another take a more active role in the land use planning process Ethan? One kind of overarching goal that I have is for us to in the next few years figure out and take advantage of opportunities where we can have um, revenue recovery mm -hmm. streams and just more enterprise functions such as with the community center when appropriate um, I mean that's not the overarching goal, but if there are special events that are being held that don't conflict with regular programming and there is some revenue to be collected, um, that's something to keep in mind, also with parking and perhaps some other services. Um, one last one is um, I think that um, really growing our partnership with the Ivy Rec and Park District um, is going to be really crucial um, for the community in general. Just um, uh, they're, they're in a time of transition right now, um, in a time of changes, and um, it was great to have, I mean, honestly, out of the entire time when, um, you know, when that I've been on the board, I've never gotten a more clear explanation about what we can and can't do in relation to parks uh, since your uh, presentation today. So that was great, and I think um, just growing that partnership will be a good thing. No, no more to add, can we do a little bit of voting? So we'll maybe do six for this because we've got three years to make this all happen. Six votes. So absorbing CSA 31. Or we want the one. Mm -hmm. Activate the trash power. Can we say five votes again? Six. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Six Try to get six. Wait, hold on. Let me let me look at everything yeah, first. Yeah. <laughs> Pick your votes now. <laughs>
Okay. Everyone ready? It's a trash. Trash, this is the... Two. Beautification program. We'll activate solar bot. Oh, I, I voted for beautification oh, yeah. too, yeah. And I might be in about that. Solar bot? Uh, The they're kind of related, yeah. Oh. Let's maybe connect those two. Yeah. So how many parking and solar? Three. Yeah, I'm, oh. I'm on. <laughs> uh, robust housing program. Three. Leadership development. One. Uh, planning. Community planning. Three. Uh, exploring more revenue streams. And then partnership with Liberia. Uh, wait, that was four, right? Oh, was that four? I didn't see oh, that. I, I, I had a hand up for that one, yeah. Uh, I think, I think I voted six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was an honest policy, so <laughs> I wasn't counting votes. So let's see, one, two, three, four. At least I went to law school, you've got a wrong fencer, so you got to figure it out. You can vote five or six so times. I'm happy to add a vote to the strength and beautification. One. And leadership development. Okay. Cool. Yeah, cool. Thanks, everybody. And I, what I imagine happening is what I need to happen is I'll create something, maybe some board meetings. Maybe if you all want to create like a subgroup after that to like look at it again and revise okay. and bring it back to the board. So they'll have like, I'll have a past and it's like committee of board members can have a past. That sounds great. We can make it look all pretty and then give it to the public. I think that that would be a really nice thing to do. Mm -hmm. I forgot to mention kind of this at the beginning. I probably should. But the point of the goals is so that I know better what to do on a regular basis without having like specific, specific direction. If I know that the board wants this overall, then I can align my work and Deborah's work. It makes the staff time more used in an effective way because if I'm doing something out of the goals, it's like, why are you doing something outside of our goals? So. Awesome. Yeah. Well, the, I guess the, um, the last thing I would say, because I believe we're at the end of our agenda on this. Yeah, um, we have one last oh, thing. Oh, wait, no, yeah, one you're right. One last thing, which is just the, this is the last fun part. We, we're supposed to be over at 445, so we have more than enough time to finish this last part, which is the district out of this in 2029. So maybe we could just, and this is one of the questions in the survey, but we will just go around quickly. And this is just so that maybe I can readjust the vision statement a little bit too, but kind of where do you see us being 10 years from now, like as a district, what do we provide? How do we act? What do we, not just what we do, but like, you know, what kind of, what do we inspire? What, what, what do we get done here? So kind of everything CSD and I of this in 2029. You want to just go around again? Sure, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, you want to go ahead and start? Sure. Um, my top one would be that um, due to our work with local public safety agencies in 2029, um, the law enforcement services here are predominantly community-oriented policing and less um, just responding to call to call. That's really, that's, this is along the lines, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I like that a lot, and, and I guess jumping off just in the safety area that um, we're, we're seeing a uh, dropping crime rate um, and a uh, safer, uh, more uh, managed and organized uh, large events when large events are happening. I find this to be very hard to um, answer just because I've only been recently appointed, so it's a hard thing to think about, um, like the future. But I mean, expanding service is always a good thing. Making, I mean, even expanding the board to include um, different people, mo uh, diverse ages, diverse ethnicities, like everything. Um, maybe gender. Oh yeah, that's yeah. yeah, that's that's very important, and I think um, it's it really that can uh, is inseparable from just this general idea of 
leadership development and leadership that looks like the community and actually represents the community. Let's just like to see us cement together enough services, powers, etc., such that we can actually command respect from the county in order to obtain the control that we like to talk about us having. I mean, like the idea right now that we that the county just keeps prioritizing sidewalks and that every single time we're all screaming no. Um, I, I'd like us being in a position where the county more does what we say as opposed to <laughs> the other. Yeah. Anything else that'd be really awesome or cool that 10 years from now we're working on, we're got accomplished in the last 10 I've years? I've always said I wanted a zip line. A zip <laughs> I wanted we're a two. zip line and an IV. We're two. Two? Where's the other side? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you start here and you're going to go to, or like, where between? Well, well, sands. Sands, sands. sands, sands to part off. There you go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> It's a pretty uh, flat district for us. Yeah. <laughs> I know. We're gonna have to. Uh, we're gonna have to uh, build them on top of the telephone poles. The <laughs> tower outside. Yeah. See that would They'll be, be good. flying cars by then. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then we won't have to solve the parking problem. <laughs> um, I, I think. Um, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I just have lighting on the brain. Um, but I would really like to see um, the community have smart lighting. I think. Uh, the, and that really goes hand in hand to and me and safety. <laughs> yeah. It's step one, like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what were you say? More trees or plants. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so by 2029, I want to see us return to a jungle. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. We're going to wild out. really fit in there. <laughs> Anything else? Um, well, as we all know, um, Ivy's housing stock is really old, um, so there is going to be a lot of redevelopment in the coming decades, which, I mean, 2029 is not that far away, so there will be some new things. A lot will probably be the same as far as housing when we take into consideration just how much things have changed, the same, stayed the same with housing, but um, just improved housing experience for, for renters. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think um, I think a big um, part of that is increasing the supply slash um, doing what we can to make sure that uh, Isla Vista's relationship with UCSB is one that is um, where where they are providing for their students, um, and and maybe sort of the goal of twenty twenty nine is uh, less people doubling, tripling, and quadrupling up. I think that that uh, would have a really great impact on um, just increasing the mental and physical well-being um, of our residents. So is that kind of like reducing housing insecurity? I think that that's, that's, that's a big portion of it. Housing, housing in general, um, uh, just us, even us just having a more active role um, in what we can do, uh, whether it's advocacy or, um, I don't know, we, get, we guess housing isn't a community facility, so I don't know if we could ever do that, even if we got rich, but. Um, There's that idea that Frank has told you and I about mm -hmm. building the parking lot and the solar lot and putting housing above it and service mm -hmm. on the bottom. I don't know how that came, and, but it and, and, just came into my head. And, you know, throughout this entire, um, retreat we've been talking so much about how the RDA was so awesome and there was all this you know awesome money and I know that um, you know once that gets re put in place uh, we're all gonna want to be very involved in, in seeing that through so I think there is a role for us um, to to be involved in, in the housing conversation
That's a great point. I would say I like to include that. Um, just the the idea of uh, transportation planning that is uh, promoting alternative transportation. It's trying to reduce vehicle miles traveled. Um, that is uh, promoting and strengthening public transportation that already exists. Um, new technologies um, that are um, uh, greener. It is. Um, the issue of our time and um, we may be a small place but we need to do our part um, if we want to have a future thank you yeah and on, on that too cause, i mean i just see when we look at on our streets there's so much space that's taken up by cars it doesn't look nice and people don't need them so I totally agree with this um but taking that uh one step further when we look at the loop, I think that there's parts of the loop that should not have vehicle traffic that right now do. Like, I think that it would be great if Cardall was a pedestrian corridor. Okay. Um, I think that would be awesome. I love so that. just yeah. more uh, public spaces that don't have cars. That's a great way of putting it. And uh, I think we've, we've probably all fantasized uh, together and separately about uh, closing part all and, and how awesome that would be. Um, just the, the times when they do for the part all carnival, it's awesome. Are there any other things that we wanted to add to this list? Um, I mean, one thing that's been mentioned kind of uh, when you and Bob were speaking in the last item was just having uh, Isla Vista be a place uh, that people don't just go to school and mm. a, a place with more stable year-round residency and that, that doesn't mean uh, just focusing on people who are uh, currently long-term residents, but making it the type of community where students go to school and then they want to stay, or people want to come here to take a job in Santa Barbara. Um, just having a higher quality of life that makes it conducive to long-term living. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. And that ties in so well with so many of the other things that are on there too, housing. Um, development. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like a great community. Awesome. <laughs> okay, well, that is basically our retreat. So if there's anything else, we, unless there's anything else, I think we are done with the agenda for now. And we're right on time. Five. Awesome. That is so great. Well, cool. we will um, reconvene, or I have to adjourn the meeting. Yes. The last thing I was just going to say is um, super looking forward to uh, when Brenda, um, I'm sorry, um, Deborah. Deborah, I don't know why I said the rest. Um, better to make the mistake now than later. So uh, um, I'm looking so much forward to when she gets brought on board and would love to do that item that we have on here that we pushed with her um, in the short term rather than the long term once she's here. So um, the one about uh, board and staff, just communication and just a chance for us to meet with her and hang out. Sounds great. Uh, do you want to, I was going to say, we need a motion to adjourn. Yes, yes we do. Is there any other public comment? Anything else? Thank you so much for coming Thank to you. members of the public. Um, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? I'll move to adjourn. I'll second that. Uh, moved by Freeman, seconded by Nguyen. Any public comment? Any board discussion? All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? There, there is one thing I would like to add. Um, Sorry, uh, we're pausing the motion. <laughs> Go ahead. Absolutely. That is, thank you for reminding us that. And I'm reminded every time that I look at the agenda. So uh, thank you for all the hard work you put in yeah. to making thank that you. happen. Okay, so we're going to re-vote. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 4-0 to zero with three absent. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.